Hello and welcome to episode 295 of Fergo on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And joining me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find on Twitter at League Freak. How are you going there, mate? Going very well, Andrew. I'm excited about the NRL season about to kick off, and I'm excited about our NRL season preview, which is the number one NRL season preview of all the podcasts. We waited to do it last because we are the best. Yeah, we knew you were you were thirsting for this pretty hard. Um, we are the number one podcast, and we're supplied by the number one in ball shaving technology. You know, Andrew. History has given us many great things. First, it started with fire, then the wheel, then wine in a box. But now we've gone a step further as a human race. We have the Lawnmower 3.0. Thanks to Manscaped.com, we now have the technology that allows us to shave our balls in the correct manner with a precision blade that is made of ceramic that has an anti-cutting edge. So you don't have to worry about cutting your boys. You're just going to cut them pubes. That's what you need to get in your life right now. So go to manscaped.com and put in our exclusive code, which is NRL, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping on every single item on their website. You can get the Lawnmower 3.0, but we recommend the perfect package to get everything. You get the crop preserver you get everything absolutely everything you could ever want in there so go there use the code it is nrl go to manscape.com do something for yourself and do something to push humanity to its new boundary its new peak so to speak exactly exactly um and with that magnificent intro done let's rip into our uh 2021 preview and what we're going to do is we're going to start from the we're going to use the 2020 ladder and we're going to start from the bottom work our way up to the top Mm -hmm. sound like a plan i like this plan let's do it all right this is going to be so much fun because we get to start with the broncos ah for the first time in their history break out the kleenex absolutely absolutely um Man, they went through a fair bit of drama last year, obviously. Uh, most importantly, their coach, they they put that saga aside by getting rid of him. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not too convinced that they found the right replacement because they got rid of one emotional basket case and replaced him with another one. So Yeah. Look, Ke- Kevin Walters, I hope he does well, but he seems like he is – emotionally wrapped up in this job and and that worries me a little bit for a coach he's taken over a club that had a pretty average off season he does still have some good talent there but it is a very young football team mixed in there are a couple of very old players players that i would suggest are pretty much done in the nrl and i can't see them finishing any higher than like 13th place on the ladder. I think it's going to be a really bad year for them. And that worries me with Kevin Walters in that he knows that this is his chance to be an NRL coach and it's the club he always wanted to coach at and they're not going to suffer fools for very long. And, you know, if he has a really bad year, the knives are going to come out because it's a good job. You know, there's a lot of people that want that Broncos role. And, you know, I just can't see the Broncos having a good year. There's already talk that Katoni Staggs is looking around at moving to another club, not this year, but next year. Mm. And he's one of their shining lights last year. And I think if he goes, they're going to probably get told by Payne Haas that he would like to leave. And if that happens, the Broncos are stuffed. Especially with a new team coming in in two years' time. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it's an interesting one. They've they've got a pretty good back line. Like mm. Herbie Farmworth, he's got a bit of toe. I actually quite quite like watching him. Um, yep. Stags, as you mentioned, very, very good. Um, Asako's going to be a fullback. Um, Corey Oates is always good for them. Yeah. Uh, very strong ball runner too. Mm-hmm. You, you, you can't go wrong when you've got basically a second rower doing kick returns from the wing. Exactly. And he's, he's tall. He's got a good leap on him as well. So it's not like he's Luke Cavell. He can jump. Yeah, yeah, he can't um, leave the ground. Yeah, uh, and he knows how to score tries too. So they've got a pretty good uh, three-quarter line. 
Mm-hmm. Fullback still got a few questions over it. Um, I think Osaka will be okay there. Their halves, there was a story which came out the other, you know, only a day or two ago suggesting that Kevin Walter still wasn't decided on who his halfback was going to be just four days before round one begins. Mm-hmm. That's not and a good sign. You've got Brody Croft, who struggled really badly last year, and this young guy, Tom Dearden, at the club, who's got huge raps and apparently has been chased by a lot of clubs, and yet they've gone with Croft over Dearden. And I just figure, after what you saw of Croft last year, last year why persist with that? Why not just give Dearden a crack at it? You know, what yeah. have you really got to lose? Look, I, I think the fact that it looks like they'll be playing Milford at 5-8, I think that's a good move for them. And Milford has to stand up because Milford is looking like if he has a bad year, he could be one of those players that, he, I mean, he might even end up in Super League. Like that's the level he played at last year. Um, I think Croft wasn't helped by the fact that the Broncos forwards last year were just soft, so utterly soft. And did and he looked good at times, but it wasn't like you watched him and said, man, he's got this all over Croft. Um, I think sometimes the Broncos, they get a youngster into their ranks and they say he's the next great one and they get stuck on them. And it, you know, how, how many times has that worked out for them? Like not very many. So I worry about them leaning that hardly towards Dearden over Croft because I, I just didn't see that much of a difference between them last year. And look, I think that Dearden probably has a, a higher possible ceiling than Croft, but it doesn't matter unless he puts it out in the footy field. Yeah. Um, but we've seen this before, and that is you you can't go into a season with uh, you know an unstable spine or one that there's very little confidence in Yeah, and expect them to do well. Uh, and I think this is the problem they still they've still got. I think they were wise to cut Andrew McCulloch, but they don't have. You know, the only thing he could provide them with was experience, because that's something they are really, really sorely lacking, and the leadership too. So he may have been able to provide that for one more season if his form warranted it, which sadly it didn't. Um, and that was mostly because injuries were a big part of that. But he's gone to the Dragons now. So they've got Corey Pakes and uh, Jake Turpin there as their hooker options, which... It doesn't fill you with confidence, does it? No, it doesn't. It just doesn't. Um, Yeah. Anthony Milford is is the the key thing here. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if... He gets moved to fullback at some time during the season. Yeah. Because he can play there, and that will make way for Dearden to join um, Croft in the halves, which I just think gives him a little bit more strike across the spine. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, they've got very little leadership when it comes to the forward pack, Um, and that's that was a problem last year, and that hasn't been rectified for this year. No, I think their forwards are, are way worse now too, so... Like, uh, it, it's it, like once they lost for feeder, for feeder was someone that even when they were playing poorly, kind of like could Tony Staggs, um, when they were playing poorly, you could still watch him and be like, man, this guy is unbelievable. Mm. When they lost him to the Titans, that was a massive blow. Uh, Payne Haas isn't like that. You know, Payne Haas, you look at him and you're like, this guy should be dominating every game up front but he was too passive in a lot of games last year. And we know that he had a disrupted off season with off off field issues. Um, It just hasn't gone right for them this off season. I think they would have liked to, you know, go about this off season, like a team that had come last, like there's no messing about. You've got to get stuck into working hard. And I I don't know that they've done that as much as they would have wanted to. Um, I, I do worry that they're going to do exactly what you said with Milford. And I personally think it would be a bad move because like they need stability in the halves. They didn't have it last year and it killed them. And I think this year I would, if I was a coach, I would find my halves pair and, and stick with them. But I look, I just think that 
They were terrible last year defensively. It's going to be very hard to turn that around in one off season. A new coach, he's going to be learning a lot about what the job entails and, you know, the, the media is going to be on him straight away. So I really do. I think the Broncos are in for another rough season. Oh, true. I think the reason why I think Milford to fullback's a better option is because they probably will be looking to get rid of him. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather Dearden and Croft, given that they look to be at the club for you know several more years now. Yeah, I'd want them to start playing together now instead of waiting until Milford leaves. I can't see the point in that. So I'd rather Milford just play at fullback where he can still do playmaking stuff, but he's not in the halves. Mm-hmm. You know, he's sort of out of the way, but not too far out of the way. So you can still use him and utilize him. But you, you're giving Dearden especially um, game time in the middle. I'd make Dearden the, the six to start with. Yeah, look, if, they, if they're getting rid of Milford, if that's their long-term goal, yeah, I'd agree with you. But that, I would start Milford at fullback for the first game. Like, I, that would be the way I would do it. I think they need stability in this team. We saw last year they were chopped and changed ridiculously. I mean... That, yeah. Like, there were points where they would lose a game by 50 points and you think, oh, he's going to change the team again, and they'd drop wingers and things like that. It was ridiculous. So Exactly. You know, they need way more stability than that this year, and I hope they find it. Yes. Now, um, one player who they need to improve immensely, but I don't think he's capable of it, is Ben Teo. Mm-hmm. He's the only experienced like seriously experienced forward they've got on their side at, at you know, an elite level. And last year he was just turning up. That was pretty much it, just turning Look, up. I, I would say that if if a club recruited Ben Teo for their New South Wales or Queensland Cup team, I would scratch my head and wonder why. And, and this is the Broncos putting him in first grade. I don't understand it. Didn't understand it last year. I know they need experience, but... You know, I think you would get way more out of some veterans that are in the Queensland Cup than you would out of Ben Teo. Yeah. Now, I have a look at their gains and losses. So they've gained John Asiata uh, from the Cowboys. He's basically a prop or a lock who can play at 5'8", mm-hmm. um, which is a bit crazy. Dale Copley, they've got a winger from the Titans, and David Mead, another winger from Catalan Dragons. They've lost... Andrew McCulloch to the Dragons, Jack Bird to the Dragons, Darius Boyd's retired, David Vafita to the Titans, Matt Gillette's retired, Joe offengau has gone to the West Tigers, and Sean O'Sullivan's gone to the Warriors. It's a lot of churn, especially a lot of them going out. It is, and you know what? Like, we talked a couple of seasons ago about this young Broncos team that was set up to dominate for years to come, and it's just been chipped away at and chipped away at, and now that promise is gone. Tell you what, though, I'm looking at that list of players who have gone compared to who's come in. Yeah. It looks to me like they're building quite a war chest, if I must use the term. Because um, they signed Jack Bird on a fair bit of money. Darius Boyd wouldn't have been cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, Gillette wouldn't have been cheap. Offhand Gowie wouldn't have been cheap. I wouldn't be surprised if it got, you know, two and a half million dollars sitting in the cap for next year. Well, for for next year, not this year. Well, you know, for ne- for next season. Yeah, uh, you know, I wonder if there's somebody out there that they would target, or if they would look to just build the club up with a, a bunch of you know depth players and youngsters and things like that. I personally think that they need a mix. I th- I think they need some, um, not older veterans, but some players that have been first graders for quite some time to be brought into the club. And, you know, and then put youngsters around them because the, – and we talked about this a little bit last year. The, the Panthers and Broncos, you could line up pretty well in terms of the ages of the teams. And the Panthers youngsters learned a lot of really good lessons and the Broncos youngsters learned a lot of really terrible lessons. And you need those older players just to, for, you know, small things like – you know, setting examples in training and, and things like that, setting examples off the field, showing these young players what it means to be a professional rugby league player. And I, I just don't think they've got enough of that at the Broncos. I agree. Yeah, you know, I've i got a... And this is just a theory. 
There's no no rumors I think to back this up. I wouldn't be surprised if they go after Brandon Smith mm-hmm. and possibly even Kevin Proctor because I believe they're both off contract at the end of this year. Yeah, Brandon. And, I mean, Brandon Smith would be a good buy. I wouldn't be shocked if the um, Warriors go after him too. True. Brandon Smith though was a Cowboys junior. Okay. Um, and Kevin Proctor's just down the road. Yeah. So I think they'd be two very handy additions to that forward pack, and that's what they need to work on first is um, a strong, sturdy hooker who can do, you know, do a lot of work in defense. Mm -hmm. And Proctor as well is a good line-running back rower who's also very good defensively. I think that would be two things that would help the side a fair bit, and I reckon that would still leave them enough money to get, you know, either a a good quality fullback or a good quality half. You know, the big problem they're going to have is that around the time that teams start looking towards building for next year is when we expect the new Brisbane team will be announced. And so they're going to be competing directly with the Broncos. Mm. Even if it's just for talent that they, I don't know, they, they stockpile away for a year, you know, um, and that's going to be really difficult for the Broncos to come up against because that new team is going to want to establish yourself. And they're going to any team like you look at Brandon Smith. If the Broncos say, look, he's the guy we want, the new team's going to have $10 million to spend. So it, it's yeah. going to be really hard to outbid them. And if they get Craig Bellamy on us, coach. Oh. Hmm. Exactly. All right. Let's move on to. The Bulldogs. Yes. Now, another club which has had a uh, coaching change. They've picked up um, Panthers' assistant coach, Trent Barrett. The architect, as we call him at Penrith. The architect. Um, everything everything Penrith did that was good is because of him. He probably put air into the footballs. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, now... The the big problem that the the Bulldogs had, which I think they've addressed pretty well, um, not entirely, but pretty well with their recruitment, was their attack. Yeah, like they had a complete inability to score points. And it's not just last year; this has been an ongoing issue for several seasons now. Um, so they've picked up quite a few good outside backs, and they also got rid of Kieran Foran. Um, he wasn't bad when he was on the field. He was actually quite good for him, but the problem was he was injured too often. Yeah, he was hardly ever on the field. Yeah. So it was handy to get rid of, to move him on, I guess, because it freed up a lot of cap space as well, which is another thing they've been dealing with. I'm pretty sure they must be close to having their cap in order now. Yeah, I think that, I think at the end of next year, they'll be pretty much clear of all their cap issues. So but, they would be pretty close now, yeah. Because they have made quite a few um, signings. They've picked up Corey Allen from South. Good um, signing. He's going to walk straight into the fullback role. Uh, Nick Kotrick from the Raiders. I mean, very handy winger indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, they've also got Cole Flanagan from the Roosters. Yeah, and he was a steal, I reckon. Absolutely. Um, very, very good goal kicker as well. So he's going to be... Yeah, that's going to be helpful. When you're struggling to score points, you need to turn fours into sixes. Yeah. And he's going to be able to help them do that. Um, also got Jack Hazrington from the Panthers. Yeah, he uh, uh, he played very well last year because he also played for the Warriors. He did, yeah. Um, he was very good for them. Very strong player. And Corey Waddell from Manly. Um, and then you look at who they lost and you – you agree with every one of them. They'll, Jack Cogg has gone to Huddersfield. Foran's gone to Manly. Carrot Holland retired. Montoya's gone to the Warriors. Suasto so Sue's gone to the Knights. Aiden Tolman's gone to the Sharks. Yeah, there's there's not one of them you kind of look at and think, oh, man, it would have been good to keep them. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure Carrot Holland ended up going and becoming a minder, minor somewhere. He might have done, yeah. Yeah. But um, I think recruitment-wise, they've done a pretty good job. There's still... There's still a few areas they need to work on, um, but I think the side is much improved on what they had last year and the year before that. Yeah, they definitely recruit. They didn't go stupid. You know, they recruited to – it was a step towards, like, next year when – if they can recruit a couple more players, 
Like they could recruit a couple of really class finishers or or like finishing touches to the team. And that's all they'll need. You know, they recruited pretty well. Kotrick, you know, I was worried about how much they spent on him, but they were always going to have to spend to get people to the club. Um, Allen was a great pickup. He played really well for South at the end of last year. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing Lewis and Flanagan in the halves. As I said, I think Flanagan was a steal. I don't know what was going on there at the Roosters, but, you know, it, it seemed to the club kind of turned on him. It was really strange. And It's funny, you know, they, they brought out that line of um, he just wasn't the right fit. Yeah, thought, which is... Don't you... Don't you figure out whether it's a right fit or not before you fucking sign him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we saw what he did at the at the Sharks. Like when the Sharks lost him, you and me were really upset for the Sharks. So he's a good signing for them. And he keeps the – like it's a good young halves pairing. If Lewis can stay on the field, like I've always liked Lewis. When he's got a few games under his belt, he's one of those real competitors – and so they could be really good halves pairing, especially in years to come if they can keep them together. Um, mm. It's going to be interesting to see if Trent Barrett has learned anything from his time as a coach at Manly, where he handled it really poorly. And then he's gone to the Panthers, where they were they were very settled as a club. That, that's a big thing for them. I think the other thing is a lot will depend on Dallin Wittini Zelezniak in a weird way, because... Of all of the players in their back line, he's the one that can destroy a team. You know, he's the one that if he is at his best, like he can be like Jared Hayne almost, where you don't know how to even handle him. Yeah. And the last few seasons, he's been absolutely abysmal. And he needs to turn that around because he's a test quality player that is not playing like a first grader. Fully agree. Fully agree. Um he and uh, I think Dylan Napper too. Yes. Um, he sort of escaped a bit of criticism, but I think I think he really needs to to lift his game a fair bit. The the Bulldogs do have a fair few forwards around. Obviously, none in the same category as Dylan Napper, who's played you know Origin and whatnot. But I don't know. I I think Napper needs to probably be told that he needs to earn his starting spot on the side. I'd start him on the bench and say, you need to earn that I was that just going to say that. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Not Like, I always think Napa is at his best when he's coming off the bench and you kind of have him watching from the sideline and you throw him in and you just, like, you know, create havoc. That always seems like his best role. I wouldn't start him. I agree with you 100%. You know, one of the good things about this uh, Bulldogs team under Dean Pay, they had less talent than every other team in the competition, but they always competed. And I think that that will, that will be good for them going forward because even though they lost a lot of games last year, they would stick in there and, and try right to the very end. You had to beat the, the, uh, the Bulldogs over 84 minutes. And we saw them play against some very good teams and push them all the way. So that'll be good for them this year. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they build on it because this is, it's a real test case for how to rebuild a club because from what I've seen of the Bulldogs at the moment, I like what they've done so far. I, I'm not sold on Trent Barrett as a coach. I'm willing to give him another chance, but for, in terms of their personnel on the field, I I just think they've been very smart in how they've spent their money. Yes. Um it's also worth noting that next year they've got Josh Adokar at the club as well. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if Dallin Matini Zelezniak's contract ends around the same time. Because I, I think once you've got Corey Allen, um, Nick Kotrick, Josh Adokar, Will Hopawati there, yeah, I'm I'm starting to wonder how you fit Dallin Matini Zelezniak in the side. Yeah, it becomes <laughs> difficult. And I can understand if the Bulldogs, you know, the if you look at the player that they got from the Panthers and what they hoped he would be, I can understand if the Bulldogs, even at this stage, have said they're cutting their losses. Yeah, exactly. Because I think he and Dylan Napper might be the only two really, really um, highly paid players they've got left on their books from, you know, from past administration. Yeah, yeah. So those two have really got to step up. Um 
Right, we'll move on to the next one, which is the Cowboys. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> The thing about the Cowboys, like the last few years under Paul Green, they just became boring. Yeah, and, and they they had a lot of injuries, and they they seemed like the test case for a team that, when their premiership winners started leaving and retiring and things like that, they never really rebuilt. They just filled holes. Yeah, and they look like a shadow of the club they really should be. Yeah, they had the, – their attack had next to no structure. Mm-hmm. It was very pedestrian. Um, you know, it was it was more predictable and more dull to watch than Parramatta at the end of last year. It really was. And the crazy thing is that they've got one of the all-time great forwards in their team who, I mean, remember he was breaking records for forward metres in a game last year, early last year. And so it's not like they don't have some ability there at the club. Like they've got a player you can build a, a dynasty around. And it's a worry because they're wasting it at the moment. Yeah, he's he's phenomenal. The other thing that's odd too is they're, um, they're, they're, still, they're still uncertain about the fullback and 5 gig, mm-hmm. and even the halfback role to some degree. They're adamant that drink water has to be in that, that region somewhere. Um, and I see in the, the round one lineup that they've posted for this week, they put, they very happily put Valentine Holmes on the wing. Yeah. Went, man, they've turned out a lot of coin for a winger. Yeah. And look, if, if he ends up being their full-time winger, it is one of the worst buys in the NRL for a number of years. Like they're paying him star fullback money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and look, he's he is he would go down as being arguably one of the best finishers in the game, no doubt. Mm. But you don't pay him fullback money, no. You know, and that's the problem they've got is that they've they've tied a lot of money in with him there. Um, they've got a, a very talented youngster there, and um, Tabuai Fidel, who filled in at fullback a few times last year, was very very good. Mm-hmm. Um, so already they've got someone there ready to go into that role. Um, Michael Morgan getting a lot of injuries and a few concussions along the way. We're getting a little concerned about that for him. Yeah, it, like this season is gonna, it's gonna be. I wouldn't be shocked if we got like a month and a half into the season, and Michael Morgan retired, based on what we saw last year. Yeah, how many injuries he was getting and how poorly he was playing, like. I just wouldn't be shocked if this was his last season in the NRL. I hope it's not because he's an origin caliber player. Well, also, I mean, he's he's a test player too. I mean, when he's on his game, he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we saw what he did in 2017 when the Cowboys were completely written off because Thurston and um, uh, Matt Matt Scott Scott. were both injured in the first few rounds and missed the entire season. And that's it. Cowboys are done. And Matthew, uh, Michael Morgan just carried that team all the mm-hmm. way through to the finals. Um, just phenomenal. And hasn't, hasn't got near it since. Yeah. It's really strange how, yeah. And, and you know, there's a feeling that he, uh, I feel like that year took a lot out of him, you know, and it between that, done. yeah. And between that and like, playing origin, playing test footy as well. He he put his body through a lot. And, you know, he, he just last year it was really sad to see it when he especially when he come back from injury and you you watched him play and you're like, oh this is this is sad right now. Um you know, when I look at this overall Cowboys team, I I really don't see much happening for them to be honest. I, I think Tom Malolo is going to play almost a lone hand. I think we're going to, as you said, I think we'll see Valentine Holmes chopping and changing from fullback to the wing, sometimes in the same game. It, it, they just look like a team that needs to rebuild. Um, Todd Payton's there to do that. You've got to give him time to do that. But I have a feeling this isn't going to be a real good season for the Cowboys. 
Well, and that's the, this is one thing that's a positive for him is is Todd Payton. He mm-hmm. he was an assistant coach there for quite a few years before going over to the Warriors, and he did some pretty remarkable stuff for the Warriors in a very trying season last year, and with a similar sort of roster, you know, one that had quite a few talent gaps in there, and um, he made them rather competitive towards the end of the season there. Mm-hmm. I think that's the benefit that that the Cowboys have got is Todd Payton knows how to get the best out of these players. Um, yeah. so I, I'm expecting the Cowboys to be a little bit better. They'll be a lot more uh, improved if Michael Morgan stays fit and is in good form. A lot hangs on him, though. It really does. And, you know, I, I'm not convinced about Drinkwater. I don't think Drinkwater's a first-grade player. That's the other thing that worries me because if Michael Morgan's not there – it almost lands on his shoulders, yeah. and you know, yeah, I, I just saw too many games where he would knock on four or five times in a game, just and it was simple stuff, you know, and that's what worries me about this Cowboys team. Um, hopefully, the club is realistic about the expectations they've got on Peyton. I think they will be. They're a pretty good club. I think they gave Paul Green plenty of time and, and leeway, and sort of trusted him. And that's what you want from a good club is to trust the coach. And so hopefully they trust Todd Payton long enough to give him time to rebuild this club because they need rebuilt. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, what are we thinking for them? Because I'm thinking I'm thinking bottom three for them as well. I think, yeah, I don't think they'll move too far. They might go into 13th or 14th. But I think they'll still be around that area. Mm-hmm. Um, I think their ceiling's going to be about 11th. Yeah, yeah. Um, next, we go to Manly. Now, I was looking through Manly's you know overall season stats mm-hmm. uh, earlier today, and they're currently in their worst run of finals drought, so to speak, in a six-year period since the 60s. So they've only made two finals series in the last six years. Wow. It didn't feel like they were that bad. Yeah, and the crazy thing is is how varied – the seasons have been. Uh, so 2016, they finished 13th. 2017, 6th, made the finals. 2018, 15th. 2019, 6th, made the finals. 2020, 13th. So they go bottom four finals, bottom four finals, bottom four. That's their run at the moment since 2016. Even 2015, they finished ninth just outside, and that was when they had that horror start of the year with injuries. And then Tuvi got them on that huge winning streak at the end of the season to almost make the finals. Yeah. And then they sacked him. Yeah, and I still think the worst decision they've made for a number of years. Easy. Um, Easy. I, I don't see much hope for Manly this year. They've got some all right plays in their team, but Tom Trebojevic, I you know, I go into a season thinking he's not going to be there basically 75% of the time. And for how much money they're paying him, he's their fullback. I just can't do that if I'm a club and they've chosen to do that. Um, so that's terrible. They've got foreign in the halves alongside Cherry Evans. Cherry Evans is one of the most, you know, experienced uh, players in the competition. He's always very good. Like he very rarely has a bad game. Although I remember one game, there was one game I put a bet. I think it was on Manly or him. And he had the worst game ever. You know what it was? It was, remember that that week where I'd got yes. um, all, but it was the last game and Manly had to win it and they had they lost to, against the Warriors or someone terrible. And yes. I lost two grand because of it. It was great. <laughs> not, that I, not that I hold a grudge, Cherry Evans, you bastard. But <laughs> apart from the, when he has a game like that, he's he's very consistent. Josh Alloye is a very good signing. Mm. Um but I just worry that they've got too many injury players in key positions and that's going to hold them back. And you've got to say that, like, Des Hasler's job since he's gone to Manly has been, as you said, in very, very inconsistent. At what point does Manly say this is too much inconsistency? Yeah, their defence last year at times was disgraceful. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> And this is the problem they're going to have this year. Is I, I think that their their depth for the last few years has been really poor, mm-hmm. and I think with the signings and and losses this year, it's got worse. Mm-hmm. 
So they've lost um, Adam Fanua Blake, which is a huge loss to their forward pack. Um, Albert Hopalwadi, Joel Thompson, another very strong edge uh, front rower. I hate that term, mm-hmm. but yeah. And uh, Corey Waddell, and they picked up Josh Alloway, um, uh, Kieran Foran, and then a couple of depth players. Andrew Davey from Parramatta, Jason Saab from the Dragons. He's a handy player. And uh, Christian Tui Palutu from the Roosters. But they've, I don't think they've improved their squad. No, and like if everybody's on the field, you can say, you know, a oh, pretty good team. Not bad. They might push for a, the edge of the finals even. But you know they're not all going to be on the field. And that's the thing. And as you said, like there were points last year where their their defense was nothing short of disgraceful, like Broncos like. Yeah. Um where they like there were I there was a game, I think it was against the Warriors, where they gave up on the Central Coast. Um and it was shocking to watch. Yeah, that so, was the, the last game of the year. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I I think that I don't think they're going to be down the bottom of the ladder, but I think they'll just be ahead of those teams. Um, you know, they'd need a lot of luck with injury to push for a final spot, but I tend to think they're not going to get there. No, I just have a look at the the last eight or nine games from last year. So nine games from last year, they only had one win, mm-hmm. and that was a thirty-two to twenty win over the Bulldogs. Yeah, and some of the points they lost, they you know they conceded forty two against Penrith, twenty six against the Warriors and the Knights, fifty six against South, thirty against Manly, thirty four against the Tigers, and that was in a thirty four thirty two loss. Mm-hmm. Uh, twenty against the Bulldogs where they won, and then the last two games they conceded forty two against the Titans and forty against the Warriors. Just yeah. woeful. Really, really was. And that and... took them from eighth on the ladder down to thirteenth. Yeah, and it was very unmanly like. Yeah, and that's the that was the shocking thing, and that's when, you know, I I started thinking like, how long can Des Hasler be running a club like this before Manly gets rid of him? But the crazy thing is that after eleven rounds, they'd only considered twenty points in a game twice, mm-hmm. and then they did it in every single game for the last, you know, nine games of the year. Wow, it's just, that's crazy. It's just like a switch just flicked. Everything just turned off. Yeah, and look, I can't think of anything that would have caused that. You know, there wasn't like – it wasn't like they lost Cherry Evans, for instance, where you no. would say, oh, yeah, that's where, where it went wrong. It just sort of happened. Yeah, it just happened. Bam. And, you know, it was against Penrith. Well, you know, we did break some hearts last year. Yeah. Including Phil Goulds. Completely broke Penrith. Um, completely broke Manly. Yeah. Um. Yeah, not much there. I think uh, Dylan Walker is going to be playing at fullback in Tom Draboyevich's absence. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I think he really needs to pull his finger out because I think for the majority of his time at Manly, he's been useless. I'll, be, I'll say it. I don't yeah. think he's done much at all. I think he's probably one of their worst ever acquisitions. Yep. Um, he hasn't nailed down a single position. And... Let's be honest, there's been a few he could nail down. They've, they've been struggling to find a half. Um, they struggled to find a centre for a while. And, you know, they've had Tom Dravojevic getting injured all the time, and he's just he's not nailed any position at all. Yeah, I agree. He's one of those players that you kind of, you know, you count down the days to when his contract comes up. I think if you're a Manly Seagulls fan, he uh, and you couple that with all the off-field issues, which are never his fault, by the way, um, and yeah, the sooner he's out of that club, the better. Yeah. Um, and also they're, they're struggling at hooker as well. We got Manasseh Fino, who's a pretty handy hooker, but I think that he's under a club imposed suspension at the moment for some drama he did in off season last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was talk that Kieran Forum was being trained up to, to do hooker work. Oh, and I geez. thought, the last thing I want is Kieran Foran being forced to make thirty tackles a game. Yeah, not not just because of the you know how taxing it is to you to a playmaker, but you know he does get injured a lot. I don't you know I want to treat him like a piece of glass. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. If you had to guess, Kieran Foran and Tom Trebojevic combined 
games played just between those two do you think it will be more than 30 no you I know what I, I wouldn't be surprised if Foran plays more than Tom Trebojevic too I agree yeah I, I wouldn't be shocked if one or both of them don't play more than six six games this year there's a there's a hot take Oh, don't say hot take. I hate, <laughs> I hate the phrase hot take. It's called a fucking opinion. <laughs> I know you. That's why I went with it. Um, <laughs> next, next is uh, the dragons. Ah, oh, the dragons. Like, has there ever been a club that has tried to turn over a new leaf, and it has gone in the worst possible direction? They, they turn over a new leaf, and underneath it is just a massive shit and they go yeah. let's step in that yeah no they had paul mcgregor as coach they got rid of him finally mm-hmm. finally and then they brought in anthony griffin who then brought in <laughs> matthew elliott you're like oh my god and, and peter gentle as well who really not not a good record if you look up his record either and That's then not- straight away like you started hearing whispers out from the media that the players weren't big fans of uh, of Hook, of Anthony Griffin. And I don't care. If your team is bad, I don't care if you hate the coach. Because yeah. if they're all buddies with the coach, I'm worried about that. Because I've been the fan of a club where, you know, the players were like, oh, yeah, the coach is pretty cool. We're getting 10th place every year. So I don't care that they don't like the coach. But then you had off-field issues. You had a couple of questionable um, signings and that were like just like puzzling signings of old players they didn't really need. And then you throw in the Israel Folau drama where they somehow managed to piss everybody off by not offering Israel Folau a contract at all. And it just seems like one of those those moves where, you know, they got to the end of last season, they're like, finally, we can move forward, new era. And so far, the new era has been absolutely horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the new era is trying to prolong 2020. Yes. We don't want to leave 2020. And all the fans are saying, can we just fucking end it? <laughs> and the poor Dragons fans, they're so tortured. Oh. Like... They they don't mess around about where the club is. They're a pretty good barometer. Apart from like, you know, they used to be pretty bad when they would get off to a good start and they'd be like, oh, premiership, yeah, yeah. And you'd be like, calm down, Dragons fans. But when they're going poorly, they're pretty much spot on about what's wrong with the club. And I'll say this, okay? I, I genuinely, as a West Tigers fan, feel the Dragons pain because that period where the Tigers were picking up a new coach nearly every second year. That's that's where the Dragons are now. Mm. And sure, they've only just replaced this coach at the moment, but something tells me that the drama going on there already before a single game has been played, it just reeks like, you know, Jason Taylor at the West Tigers all over again. It really does. Um, oh, man, that is a great comparison. Like, Because Jason Taylor, he was set up to be a long-term coach, and the drama yeah. started immediately, and it just started, you know. Oh. Quite quite coincidentally, the first player that Jason Taylor pissed off is, and the same player that Anthony Griffin pissed off was the hooker and captain mm-hmm. and the most wholehearted player on the entire side. And that was, you know, Taylor with Robbie Farrar and Griffin has managed to piss off Cameron McInnes, who's going to go to the Sharks next year. Yeah, and is out all this year. Yeah. Which, uh, what did he do? He Did he do his uh, ACL? or uh, He did his convenience injury. His convenience injury. Yeah. Oh, I don't have to play all year now, so fuck him. Well, see, when he, <laughs> when he it come out that he wasn't happy with Griffin, I didn't care. No, likewise. You know, but like, do something. You know, win, win some games, get in the finals, and then be upset about your coach. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I look at this team, this is another team that needs a little bit of a rebuild, and I, I'm not convinced by some of the players that they've brought in. You know, Jack Bird is probably the big signing for them. Yet Jack Bird hasn't really played football for just about three years now, it feels like, and 
you know, he's one of those players that he he unfortunately gets catastrophic injuries and he'll get him at training and stuff like that. So, I, you know, you can't rely on a player like that until they become reliable. Um, you yeah, know what? Well, I... That's right. I mean, Jack Bird has played 17 games since 2018. Mm. That's it's terrible. Yeah. I mean, he played 17 games in 2017 alone. He's only played 17 games in the three years since. Yeah, and, and look, he's he's pretty talented. I don't think he's as talented as a lot of people say he is, but he's all right, but he can't stay on the field. Um, yeah. There's a, a number of players in this team that, like you go between players that are all right to some players like, I mean, Trent Marin, I, I, he just feels like, Time has passed him by. I can't believe he's still in their, in their side. But then you get someone like a Paul Vaughan, who went from one of the best front rowers in the world to being nowhere. Like last year, he was anonymous. And yeah. they need those plays to turn their season around. The crazy thing for the Dragons is um, a little stat I've got here. Mm-hmm. Three players scored 62% of their points last year. That was Matt Dufty, Zach Lomax, and Michaeli Ravalawa. Mm-hmm. That's nuts. That's crazy, yeah. That's not, and that I mean, that's not just you know goal kicking from Lomax. I mean, that's the try scored by Ravalawa and Dufty. I mean, the the fact that those three players and most of those points are coming through Lomax, either him mm-hmm. scoring or him setting up, you know, players around him. That kid is so damn good. He is too good to be in this dragon side. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if someone him. poaches him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And look, Ravalawa last year, he was all right. You know, it wasn't like he was destroying teams. He was just all right. So for him to be one of their top three point scorers is pretty nuts. Um, their halves, you know, Corey Norman, Ben Hunt, what's going on there? I know Corey Norman is under suspension because he defended himself and the NRL doesn't like that. They like rugby league well, players these days to be victims, which is yeah. great. He did um, He did get his punishment halved again the other day, I saw. Oh, did he? See, I, yeah. I didn't hear that. I didn't. So he's only, he only misses round one, and okay. I think he's fined down to 10 grand or something like that. St- that and it's still ridiculous. It's still, it's still stupid. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, this is – it's still a Paul McGregor side. It, and, you know, if Griffin is in charge of rebuilding this team, he's got a lot of work to do before it doesn't look like a Paul McGregor side. But that's the job for a coach. Like, can he make this team that he has in front of him win games? I think if they all play at their best – they could be, I don't know, 10th place. But I can't see mm. them making the finals. The, the thing they've got is they they lost some absolute workmen in the forwards mm-hmm. and didn't replace any of them. Yeah. So Tyson Brazil's gone to the Knights. James Graham obviously went to St. Helens. Um, Corbin Sims has gone to Hull KR. They also lost Jacob Host as well and brought in... Daniel Alvaro from Parramatta. Not a bad Farm- signing. No. Farmer Sully from the Roosters, who's also not a bad signing. He's, you know, he'll be a good um, – I would be surprised if he starts at prop more times than not this mm-hmm. year, but he'll be on the bench. He'll be in the 17. And and there was talk early on that Jack Bird was going to be moved into the forwards, and I thought, there's a bad idea. Not because yeah. I don't think Jack Bird's capable of it, but you know when you've only played 17 games in three years because you've been injured so much, I don't think moving a centre to the forwards is a good way to go about no, no. dealing with that player. So yeah. it's that means they've, they've weakened their pack, and when they've been struggling to score points and and dominating games, the worst thing you could do is weaken your forward pack. Yeah, because and that was their time. strength. Exactly. I was going to say, at times that forward pack looked really good. Um, last year they looked beaten up, though. Like for mm. three quarters of the year they looked beaten up. And, yeah, it just – they're going to have to rely on a couple of youngsters coming through, I think, that hopefully set the world on fire and give them something to build around. 
Um, it's going to be a really interesting season watching them. I don't think it's going to be fun for Dragons fans. I don't think they're going to be a fun team to watch, but it's going to be a really good test for Griffin's coaching. And we'll find out, we'll find out if he is, you know, he's wherever he's gone, he's always made a team pretty good. You know, there's a lot of talk about he can't win premierships and stuff. You know, the two clubs he's really had a go at, the Broncos and Panthers, he did pretty damn good at both of those clubs. So we'll see if he can do it here at the Dragons. Yes, and uh, I think he's going to get a bit of space in the cap too at the end of the year because I dare say Jack DeBellin comes off contract at the end of the year mm-hmm. with the Dragons that have kept on the books. Uh, Corey Norman, I believe, is off contract. I think so, yeah. Um, and I think they've got... Was it one more year of Ben Hunt? Might be two. Um, but, yeah, I mean, those those two players coming off contracts going to throw up a bit of coin as well. So <laughs> hopefully they can make some astute purchases with that cash. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, all of these clubs that are, are freeing up cash, they're going to have to deal with that Brisbane team if they get the green light. But um, it's interesting how many teams need rebuilds, hey? Yeah, um, a lot of them have just gone and gone all in on, you know, some players who sometimes it works out. You go, you go and spend a bit of a coin on an injured player or yeah. someone whose form has been down a bit. And you go, you know what, we'll go all in. We'll, we'll give these blokes a second chance and maybe that will spur them on to play well. Yeah. And it's always a 50-50 call. Yeah, and, and you, you know, the thing is too, like, I, I – I don't mind if you if you go all in on say a Dallin Wittini Zelezniak like the Bulldogs did, and it doesn't pan out. I can say you know what, you couldn't foresee that. That's on him, and sometimes you just got to cut your losses. But when yeah. you go in all in on a player that is injury prone, or they're old, like they're just too old, that's when I can blame the club. Exactly, exactly right. Um, oh, this one will be fun. West Tigers. <laughs> Are you ready, Andrew? I'm ready. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise you here. Okay. I'm gonna be a little bit more optimistic about this. Why? I'm just not, look. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say something stupid. I'm not, I don't think the Tigers are gonna make the finals. Okay. But right now, what I've seen from the recruitment of what they're doing at the West Tigers, sure, there's been somewhere I go, why are you still doing this? But at the same time. They are building mm-hmm. some depth around the forwards, mm-hmm. and they're building a decent starting pack, yep. and that hasn't been in place for a long time. Is it perfect? No. Um, they've still got a weakness with their halves. They still don't know what, what's going on at fullback, although I think that's been shored up a bit by getting Dane Laurie. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, I've only seen one trial game of him at the Tigers, and he looked damn good there. Yeah. So all the signs are pretty good there, but um, there's still a lot of key positions with question marks over them. Uh, I believe Luke Brooks might be in his last or second last season of his contract at the moment, mm-hmm. um, and I think he really needs to pull his finger out this year because the biggest problem he has is he's not a dominant voice on the field. No. When you look at his actual skill set, he has all the skills. He can. You know, he's got a pretty decent kicking game, long and short. He's got a good passing game. Um, he's got plenty of speed. He can take intercepts. His tackling technique is okay-ish. His mm-hmm. size doesn't help him. No. Um, but he can, you know, get there and sort of hang on to someone who's a lot bigger than him and, until help arrives whereas a lot of other Haas just get completely destroyed and bumped off and they're completely pointless. So he's kind of a little bit like a terrier in that regard. You know, he's just sort of sitting there with his teeth hanging into someone's sock as the person runs off. You know, he's still hanging on. (laughs) Pretty much him. Um, So I think his skill set is definitely good enough. But the one thing he needs, which he's never had, is the ability to go, you know what, this is my fucking team. And when I say shit, we do it. And that's his yeah. problem. Every yeah. time he's played well, it's because Robbie Farrer or Benji Marshall's been there doing that one job for him. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's almost like, it's like baking a cake and you've got all the ingredients and it, it comes together and you do everything right. 
And then when it's finished, it's like a real bland pound cake. And, yeah. you know, it's going to, you know, it, it is a cake technically, but it's not going to make anyone, you know, friends with you for offering it to them. No, um, right. You know, when you think about how important a spine is in the NRL and you look at this West Tigers team and you look at their spine and it's it, it's a real worry because the only one there that you can say is consistent in their position and has, you know, been there for a while. It's Luke Brooks. And as as we say, he's like, he's all right. He's played all right, but he doesn't take over games, which he, he really needs to, especially in this team. Um, but the, as you say, like some of the forwards that they've recruited, James Tamo, I think they got him at the perfect time. Um, often Gowie, I like him as a player. Um, Bloor, I think, will be better this year. We know that Luciano Leilua, it, like he's one of those players. I, I think you and me are both big fans of him. Oh, yeah. I mean, he blew everyone away last year. I don't think anyone expected him to do what he did last year so well. I mean, he dominated. He really it, did. It wasn't for bits and pieces. He did it from start to finish. Yeah. Um, they've also picked up uh, – uh, geez, I'm going to pronounce this wrong – Yuta Kamanu from the, uh, from the Eels. Mm-hmm. He's a big unit, uh, only 20. Uh, so I th- I think he's going to be a pretty handy pickup as well. They've got some depth in the forwards at last. And at the end of this year, Russell Packer will be off contract. So that's another huge chunk of money they're going to have available. Mm-hmm. The year after, Moses and Bayer comes off contract, another huge chunk of money. So I think they're going to be starting to use that cash to pick up, you know, more good players in key positions. But, and to be honest, all they're going to really need is – at least one dominant half. If they can get a really good five eighth or a good halfback, they can move Brooks from one position to the other. Yeah, that's all they need. Um, so I think Luke Brooks would probably go really good at five eighth if he had a controlling halfback. He doesn't need to be a test player. It just needs to be the sort of halfback that can just run plays. Would you like to get Jackson Hastings? Um. I don't think he he fits what the Tigers need. Yeah. What about what about Mitchell Pierce? That's kind of more what the Tigers would probably require. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get Mitchell Pierce because of his game breaking ability. You get yep. him for the fact that he can control a game and he can set up plays where you need them to, and he's consistent. Mm-hmm. You know that's what you need. And if if you've got someone doing all of that hard work for Luke Brooks, then Luke Brooks is free to sort of roam around and play his natural game without having to worry about the, you know, the one main job you expect from a halfback, which is to lead a team around the park. Okay, I've got a question for you. I've got mm -hmm. a question for you. Mitchell Pierce has recently signed a downgraded one-year contract extension for the Knights. If I offered you Mitchell Pierce on more than he's at now at the Knights, let's say... Let's say he's on, say, six hundred grand at the Knights right now. If I offered you him for seven fifty for the next three seasons, would you take him? I would say let's do a swap. Mm-hmm. Um, either mm, I'd say Moses and buy for Mitchell Pierce. <laughs> You'd swap or, Moses and buy. Yeah. But the the Knights have to want to want the player. There you go. I would mean, you, they bought they bought Connor Watson. Would you would you swap? Okay, I'm going to go through some of the players here. Russell Pack is another one. They can take you if they want. Would you swap him for Joey Leilua? Would you swap him for Joey Leilua? Yes. Would you swap him for James Roberts? Not yet. Would you swap him for Jacob Little? Yeah. Okay. I, I think you were so you're willing to deal. Yeah, I I think Mitchell Pierce is as I said, I'm getting him for one major aspect. He's defensively strong as well. So make it two. Mm-hmm. Defensively strong and he can run plays. Yeah. Okay. And just just simple he doesn't have to run every play. Just simple things that Brooks struggles with. I mm-hmm. think Pierce um you know, can complement him well on. He can fill in the gaps that Brooks struggles with. And like anybody that is listening just for the first time this year, my feeling is that Mitchell Pierce 
would be an amazing hooker for most clubs. He probably would. Yeah, I think with his defense, he doesn't get injured that often. I think it would take the playmaking out of his hands. You take that off of him. I think he would be brilliant as a hooker. And, you know, it it, it would be interesting to see if club rolled the dice on him in that in that way. And if he'd be willing to play as hooker as well, I can understand if he said, no, nah, I'm a halfback, I'm not doing that. I think I think he's okay when it comes to playmaking. He's just what he struggles at is trying to be Daily Cherry Evans. Yes. DCE can do every playmaking duty for an entire game, and it's he does it on his hat. It's a piece of piss for him. Yeah. Mitchell Pierce can't do that. If he has to share the role with someone, I think that's when he's a lot better because he doesn't have to do it all the time. So the defense isn't always on him, and so he doesn't have to panic all the time and trying to come up with a play all the time. He does it when he needs to. Yeah. And Luke Brooks is a little bit similar in that sense. And because Brooks hasn't had – um, a consistent halves partner for several years. You know, Benji's the most consistent, and he's been missing for a few years in that process. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's had to take on a lot more of that responsibility, which is hard to do when you're not telling, when you're not directing the team around. So everyone sort of just stand around waiting for him to do something. And oh, what player we run in here? And it's just all a bit clunky and standoffish, and that's why their attack's been pretty average for a while. If Brooks doesn't step up and do it for the Tigers this year, are you will and like he's their number one playmaker? Are you willing to start looking towards where you're going in terms of? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think at some point you've got to say, look, what we want Luke Brooks to be is not what he is. He is what he is. I think it's a very similar thing with Mitchell Pierce. Like he's not the second coming. He's just a, a an all right halfback that's a very good defensive player. Um, And I I feel as though Brooks is, he's sort of settled into being the player he is. And this is the season for him. It's his club. And if he doesn't do it this year, I don't think he's ever going to be the player you kind of hope he's going to be. And we've all hoped he's going to be. Yeah. You've got two types of halves. One is the absolute star who can do everything. And the other is the bloke who likes to be part of a partnership. Mm-hmm. And Brooks is the second one. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think if he went to the Storm as a replacement for Jerome Hughes, I think you'd probably see his game go to another level because Munster would be doing a lot of the the legwork. Yeah. And that's kind of what he wants to be. He 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 likes being the number seven, but struggles with doing all of the duties all of the time of a number seven. Yeah, yeah. So he needs someone to help him out in those roles. That's why he's always played at his best when Benji's there, because Benji can, you know, Benji just does it. We're thinking that the the West Tigers will finish between probably eighth place and tenth place. Yeah, I'd, I'd say eighth, eighth and twelfth. It's a pretty big margin of error. That's huge for them. Yeah, yeah, they're not I'm, a finals team. Not yet, but they'll. They'll miss the finals by just enough to break your heart. Well, heart's broken pretty well. Yeah. They'll, they'll miss the finals by enough to go, ha, ah, they finished ninth again. Yeah. Yeah, like um, that that, uh, that gritted teeth laugh that you, you try and hold back the tears. Yeah, that's the one. Mm-hmm. I, I am curious to see how James Roberts goes, though, because he's been looking pretty damn good and pretty keen in, in all the preseason. Mm-hmm. Um. He looks like he's got his head in the right place for the first time in a long time. And so if he can come out and have a really good season, yeah. um, that's going to give the Tigers attack, you know, quite a bit of an edge for the first time in a while, which is going to be good to see, especially when you've got Nofaluma scoring a ton of tries now and um, Luciano Lailua, you know, smashing holes on one side of the field as well. I feel like I've seen this this uh, movie with James Roberts and I know how it finishes. He'll have a couple of good games and then it'll all go to shit and then he'll get moved to another club. Eh, possibly. That's my feeling anyway. That's my hot take, Andrew. That's your hot take. That's my hot take. Yeah, I I think you'll see it the season. Okay. I reckon he'll probably start in red hot form and then slowly drift back and just be consistently solid. If I, don't, Moses I don't think he's going to be 
I got, I got a question. Yeah. If Moses and Bai starts, <laughs> <laughs> if Moses and Bai starts in twenty plus games for the Tigers, your season's been terrible, hasn't it? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. We're Agreed. we're on the same page there. I I wrote a uh, a preview for the West Tigers for the League Unlimited website, mm-hmm. and one only one person managed to point out that I didn't list Moses and Bai in the 17 at all for the Tigers' best lineup. Yep. And they said, why isn't Moses and Bai there? I was like, why should he be? Mm-hmm. This is a problem. It's not a criticism of Moses and Bai. It's a fact that he's one of about four different players that are all the same skill set. And it's either you put him at 5'8 or you put him at fullback. And you can't have four of those players filling two positions. You're not going to put two of them on the bench. No, and it like it's weird because he come out of an, an era at the Bulldogs where they had about five or six players like him that were a jack of all trades, master of none, and they kind of didn't have a position, but they could probably do something for you if you really were, you know, stuck. And the weird thing is that Mbai got this ridiculous contract of all of those players. Thanks, and, Ivan. Yeah. It's it's a weird one. It Ivan, is. he really he planted the seed and then he left. The the uh, the animosity still rages. The, he planted the virus. <laughs> it was all him. <laughs> oh, COVID, Cleary. <laughs> all right, who's next? The Warriors are next. Okay. Oh man, there's another club that. I mean, I. I what do you say about them? Like, first of all, let's say the situation they're in is not good at all. They're once again looking like they're going to play the entire season in Australia. They're going to be based on the Central Coast, which poor buggers. Um, Roger Tuivasa Shek has already said he's going to play rugby union. You know, they've got the new coach in Nathan Brown, who I don't rate. Immediately hired Phil Gould. Yeah, feel good. At least feel good didn't have to do the job over text messages, hey? Uh, he's been able to do it via Twitter. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah, um, he's just taken it, a few photos and put them on Twitter and gone, well, that's my job done. It's all done, yeah. All just done, to prove that I'm here. In between, still crying over the Panthers fucking themselves out of the grand final last year. Oh, so yeah, he was blaming the, the, the refs. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, they got Fanua Blake, who's a good signing, really good signing. Um, it looks like Harris DeVita is going to be their number one halfback, which should have happened two years ago. Yeah. Ben Murdoch Masilla coming back from Super League. There's been a lot of talk about him. I need to see it happen on the field before I get too excited about it. I, I, I think they're going to be hopefully a little better than last year, but my hopes aren't high. The thing I'm finding about them, okay, a lot of people have spoken about the size of their forward pack. They mm-hmm. have, they they will have, I'm pretty certain, the heaviest forward pack in the comp this year. Yep. Which would have probably been absolutely fucking amazing in 2014, 15, yep. 16, 17. I'm not too sure when you've got a comp going faster and faster, having a huge forward pack is a great asset. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of the times this year the Warriors lead at half time and lose the game. Yeah, I, you know, I, when I heard that they said they were bulking up, I couldn't believe it because it was the complete opposite of what you've wanted. And any time I've ever heard a club saying, you know what, we're bulking up over the off season, it's always been a disaster. Absolutely every single time. Um, you know, it's going to be a difficult enough season for them. The weird thing about last year is that when some of their players decided to go home and they were replaced by basically New South Wales Cup players from other clubs, they started playing better as a team, and that's always a pretty bad sign. Um, you know, we'll find out how it's going to go this season. I thought that they wouldn't win a game last year, and they proved me very wrong. So... It's going to be interesting to see how Roger Chulvasashek plays. I feel like they've got a lot of money to spend for next year that they're freeing up, and I feel like they're going to spend it on the wrong player. (laughs) Like, 
it, it, you know, th- they'll talk about this player and that player and then they'll sign someone on a big deal and we'll all be, like, horrified by it. But, you know, that's unfortunately the way the Warriors have been for years now. Yeah. It's... um. It's, it must be frustrating being a Warriors fan. You got mm-hmm. all of New Zealand, all of the Pacific Islands, even of talent to pick from, and they managed to get a bits and pieces team pretty much every year. They've got a few good players in there. Tohu Harris is an absolutely phenomenal player, massively underrated too, in my opinion. Even though he's played Test footy and all that sort of stuff, I just don't think people praise him or you know respect the work he does highly enough because he is phenomenal. He was crazy good last year. Yeah. Um, Fanua Black would be pretty handy. If he can reel in the stupid penalties he gives away, he'll be an absolute asset to the side. Yeah. Um, Jermaine Tanua Brown was an absolute massive find. Um, so they've got some – they do have some pretty good quality forwards there. Um, their backs, I'm still not – I don't know. They've got Peter Hickey and you and Aiken probably at the centres, which doesn't doesn't interest me at all. Mm-hmm. Um, the wingers are, you know, they they're worries wingers. They're big, powerful, bloody bulldozers. They just destroy humans and score tries. That's what they do. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that continues. Their spine, yeah, you know, Roger Tullabashek is obviously world class. Nikarima can be a bit rocks and diamonds at times. Harris DeVita is getting better every year. And I dare say Wade Egan will be the hooker who's solid, I guess. Yeah, he's he's all right. He's not going to – solid is the right word for him. Like, he's not going to let them down. No, that's right. Um, they've churned through a lot of players too. And usually when you get a lot of, a lot of player turnover, it means that it can take a year or two before things start to improve. Mm-hmm. So they've gained Ewan Aiken, Kane Evans, Adam Fanua Blake, Marcelo Montoya, Ben Murdoch Masilla, Sean O'Sullivan, um, Elias Rativa from Rugby Union, and Bailey Sirenen. And they lost Jared Beale, Adam Blair, Lachlan Burr, Patrick Herbert, Adam Kieran, Tani Milne, Ignatius Parsi, Isaiah Papali, and Nathaniel Roach. Yeah, like heaps. Not, yeah, but still, not really anyone there that you're aghast <laughs> at losing, is there really? That's right, but I mean. This is the thing. It just means that there's a whole heap of new combinations that have to be created. Everything has to reset and start all over again. And that takes time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, and if once again, another club that I don't think they need the same rebuild as a lot of other clubs. I think they're further along. Yeah. And they're going to have massive money available for a play next year. Like they can, almost pick any player in the world they wanted. And that player is going to have to turn down probably the biggest contract they've ever been offered. But it's all in the hands of Nathan Brown, and that worries me. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, Now we move on to the Titans. Hang on, where do we think the the Warriors will finish? Because I feel like like they're going to be about 13, 12, yeah, 13, I'm, 11, something around there. I'm guessing bottom four. Yeah. And oh, by the way, next year, if we're all COVID free by then, touch wood, every single game should be in New Zealand. They well, should a, not play an away game. There was a story coming out saying that they were putting in a $2 million bid to make sure that happened. And I thought, hang on, why the fuck should they be making the, why should, why should they be paying for it? Yeah, exactly. It should just be something there. Look, if the NRL come out and said, as soon as the Warriors can have a, a normal regular season, we're going to play three seasons where they don't leave New Zealand, I'd be fine with that. As a Panthers yeah. fan, I'd have no problems with it. I think given Peter Volandi's got so much praise for getting the comp going two weeks earlier, a lot of that wasn't going to happen if it hadn't have been for the Warriors. Yeah. So I think he needs to repay them for all the bloody good press he got by giving them what they want, which is a season full of home games, or at least two of them, and not make them pay for it. Yeah, 100%. And, like, even if you said to them you've got your normal home games, but outside of that you have to travel around New Zealand for your away games. Yeah. 
like I see no problems with that. And I, as I said, I would do it for a few seasons in a row for them. I think they deserve it. I think that they've earned it, quite honestly. Absolutely they have. And I know I said it before last year. I think it's a um I think it's something that they they definitely deserve and you know, the NRL could do it I guess to try and scope whether another New Zealand team could be a possibility. Yeah, yeah, and I think that they should bring in I'd be up for another Kiwi team. I'd I've always been up for another Kiwi team. Fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, we'll get into the Titans. Okay. Exciting they, team this year. The they Titans. really are. Um, it's worth noting that after 15 rounds last year, they had four wins and 11 losses and were sitting 13th and only one win clear of last. Mm-hmm. And then they come up against, you know, four teams that were in the, the, the bottom half of the draw or bottom half of the ladder and then the Knights who finished in the top eight. But they won five straight games and started to click. And so, sure, they went up against strong opposition, but things started to click. They started to get their defense in order. They started to get a really good defensive structure. Their attacks started to work. They started Um, competing. Yeah, and it came at exactly the same time that Jamal Fogarty became captain. Mm -hmm. Just immediately, things just started to work. They beat the Dragons 14-10. They beat the Dogs 18-14. They beat Brisbane 18-6. They smacked Manly 42-24. And then they just absolutely destroyed Newcastle 36-6. That was the game, that last one against the Knights, where I started looking at the Titans going, yeah, I think they're going to be improved next year. The four games before it were against also Rants, but that game against the Knights, when the Knights were in the finals... You know, that was again when they're up against a genuine top eight side, and they they dominated them from start to finish. And then they added in the signings that they've made to their forward pack. Mm-hmm. Have been all of them have been phenomenal. Yeah, their forward pack is going to be just amazing to watch this year. I can't wait. Like of all the teams in competition, they're probably third into or fourth maybe in terms of the teams I'm looking forward to watching. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if Fafida is going to, like they've paid him a lot of money. And the Gold Coast have done this before. They've paid for a Broncos player and none of them have ever really panned out. But I think Fafida is going to be a juggernaut for them. Like he's something special. Yeah. Um, Brimson towards the end of last year was amazing. We saw him step up in origin. So I think he's going to be better this year. Um, obviously Fogarty, you know, we saw what he did. He, like he's just the prototypical comes out of Queensland Cup experienced knows who he is as a player as a person and was just comfortable and I think that that gave them a lot as a team and it allowed um, Ash Taylor to have a lot of pressure come off him and he started playing all right you know he wasn't playing great but he was playing all right it's well below what he should be playing for the contract he's on but if he can just play all right again this season I think the Titans are a definite finals team. Absolutely, absolutely. I I would I'd be surprised if they don't make the finals this year. Yeah, we're, like whereabouts in the finals do you think? Because I'm thinking seventh. I think it. Yeah, I was going to say sixth, around sixth place. Yeah. I think they'll be. I think they'll be above that scramble for the last two places, but I think they'll be just behind the the front runners. I think they'll probably have a. A steady start because mm-hmm. they too have had a lot of changes to their side, so it could take a few weeks to get everything to sort of click into place. Their attack should be fine because they've not had any real changes to their to their attacking outfit in the backs. Um, so just a few little things here and there. So there could be a, few, a little bit of inconsistency in the first four or five rounds, but I think they'll start to pick up. They may struggle during the origin period now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I reckon they'll be very strong at the back end of the season, which should be enough to see them um, sneak into the finals. Look at that forward pack, though. They've got Fodder Waker at the prop. They'll probably have um, Tino Fasumalui from the, the Storm. He's a he's a fucking tank, that bloke. He's a, he was a great, he's the under the radar signing for them. Yeah. Like I know a lot of people have raps on him, but all the attentions on David Fafita, and can you imagine those two? Oh, 
it's nuts. It's going to be so good. Uh, then you try to throw in Dave Fafita, Kevin Proctor. Um, then you pick of Herman SASA, Sam McIntyre from the Tigers, Sam Lasani, Jared Wallace. That's some. That is a good forward pack and some good depth on the bench as well. Yeah, that's unbelievable. It really is. I, I'm really excited about this team, and you know, I, I hope that they come out and they they really do something straight away because Titans fans really deserve something to be excited about. It's been a long time between drinks for them. And, you know, they've got a team which is exciting all of a sudden. It's yeah. great. Yeah, it's it's going to be very interesting to see how they go. Um, as I said, I think defensively they'll be improved. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that goes without saying. So it'll be interesting to see, I think, how Fogarty uses Fafita in attack. Yes, and which player will be running off Fafita, given that Fafita likes to run through the middle a lot, which is a bit unique for a bloke who's a you know second row and runs a bit wider. And, think, and that's the crazy thing about him. Like, he's got – he can run in the middle of the field and break the game open from there, but then he can also go wide and break the game open from there. And if they learn how to use him – and look, the Broncos were using him pretty well. Like – if you take David Fafita and put him in, in a terrible team, he's going to break the line and make some players around him look pretty good. If the Titans learn how to use him really well, it, it could make them push towards maybe fifth on the ladder. I don't think they're going to get to fourth, but they'll be, they'll be one of those teams that is not fun to play against, that's for sure. I wonder if you wait a year or two, Mm-hmm. and then try and make him into the second coming of Jason Tormalolo and put him at lock. He's got the footwork. He's got the speed off the mark. He's got he the frame. He to the middle. Yeah, he's got, yeah. The, he's got the size. I, I, It's a good question. Like, he, you know who he reminds me of? And I know it's probably a – he reminds me of a, a bigger-framed Gordon Tallis. But I don't think Gordon Tallis, even at his best, had the – like when Gordon Tallis would break the line, he'd be through the line and, you know, he he had all right speed. Though Fafita breaks the line, he's bigger than Gordon Tallis, but he's got the speed to go the distance, which yeah. is nuts. He's an incredible athlete. Fafita too has much better footwork than Tallis. Yes, yes. Tallis would use his, his strength and his upper body, whereas Fafita can use his strength and his footwork. And, it, man, it's... The kid's a freak. He really is. He really is. And, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up at, at lock because I think if he if he gets a little bit of a, a ball-playing ability to him, good luck. Good luck stopping him. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, and um, Justin Holbrook's doing a pretty handy job there. We we're, were both a bit sceptical of him at the start of the year given he'd only coached at St. Helens. Yeah. Which, you know, any man and his dog can go and coach at St. Helens and take him to a you know, grand final. Yeah, 100%. He's done some really good work with the roster. You know, he's uh, he's he's bought very, very astutely. He's got rid of the plays he needed to get rid of. Um, probably would have liked to keep Jai Arrow. Mm-hmm. But if you've got to lose him to pick up another really good, strong quality forward, then why not? Yeah, you're uh, talking for, for feeder every day. Yeah. But, I mean, he also got rid of... Uh, Bryce Cartwright, Shannon Boyd retired, Keegan Hipgrave, very solid second rower, so you, you probably could have hang on to him. Ryan James, who'd been under a lot of injuries for the last two years, he's mm-hmm. gone to Canberra. Um, young Tonham Mapia, he's off to Rugby Union, didn't play much in the you know, in the Titans back on. And Nathan Peets has been released. Yeah. Uh, and look, the thing that you can say about Justin Holbrook is you could see early on last year he played around with the team a little bit, looked at his combinations, and then he settled. He settled on what he felt was going to work and gave them time to gel, didn't panic, and it worked. And so we'll see how he goes this year because it's a very different job for him this year. It really is. He's got um, – instead of trying to figure out who's going to work this – and um, not going to work this year, now he's got to figure out you know how we win games and become consistent in the, mm-hmm. the areas that matter. Yep. So, yeah, they're going to be one team everyone's going to be excited about watching. Um, who's next on here? The Sharks. The Sharkies. Oh, man. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't need a new coach. That's clear. 
that is very clear. <laughs> Um, we can't make that clear more clear enough than we already have, and we'll probably end up making it even clearer during the year. No doubt there will be angry podcasts, and we will make that statement over and over again. They do not need Shane Flanagan. Because so long as Buzz Rothfield remains in the media and mates with Shane Flanagan, you will still be hearing about calls for the Sharks to get Flano back as coach. Mm-hmm. And every single time that call is fucking stupid and should be ignored completely 100%. Exactly. Exactly. And by the way, while all that's going on, like you look at their gains and their losses, very like not much happening at Cronulla. It's not like this is a club that is, you know, buying lots of talent or anything. Kind of stand and pat for the most part. Yeah, because I think but, they've got a lot of players coming off contract this year. Yeah, and like Josh Morris, who has only really ever lost players at his time there, just keeps getting them in the finals, keeps getting them, you know, way above where they really should be. Yeah, I mean, that's the good thing about John Morris too. He's managed to get a lot of uh, young kids into the team as well. He's got the junior pathways working as it should do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's been really handy. But, yeah, he's got – um pretty sure he's got most of his expensive players coming off contract at the end of the year. Josh Dugan's trying to get a contract extension at the moment. They should um, move on. Sean Johnson's off contract at the end of the year. Andrew Fafita might have a year left. Um, Aaron Woods is in his last year, I believe. Uh, Matt Moylan's in his last year. Mm-hmm. If they all go, that's several million dollars freed up. and. Yeah. They've already got um, a fullback in William Kennedy. They've already got two halves in there in Toby Rudolph. Sorry, not Toby. In um, uh, I forgot their names now. Oh, what's his name? Braden, oh. Braden Trindle. That's it. And, and Connor Tracy. Yes. So they've already got those two guys there ready to take over. They've got an absolutely brilliant hooker in Blake Braley. I mean, he came on in leaps and bounds so much last year. Mm-hmm. So their spine is set already, and they've got means to spend. That's yeah, the phenomenal that, like, thing about it. And if they if they pick and choose who they get rid of, they can keep enough experience in this side, but bring in players that will complement the young spine that they've got and set themselves up for years to come. Absolutely. And this is a great thing. All Sharks teams, since Flano took over from them, have had very strong forwards packs, and that's definitely hasn't changed here. Mm-hmm. The only thing that they need to work on this year, more than anything, is their defence. Yeah. Because their defence last year, especially in the middle, was dog shit. It was horrible. Yeah. There's a few teams that finished outside of the top eight who had better defence. Um, the Titans, they conceded 17 points less than the Sharks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Warriors... Uh, the Dragons even had better defense than the Sharks. And you think the Bulldogs, who finished second last, only conceded 24 more points than the Sharks did. Yeah, and it, look, it really hurt them having Fafita injured up front. And Fafita was injured basically all year. Like, mm. it, like, ta- like I, I won't say anything bad about Andrew Fafita's performance last year because I think he shouldn't have been playing and I think he dragged his ass out onto that field and did his best. Um, they're going to have hopefully him and he's sl- slimmed down a lot. If he's back, Tolman's there. To- look, Tolman's a toiler. He's not going to do anything amazing for you. He's also defensively but, strong. Yes, yes. And look, if, if that's just all they needed to do to just get – a little bit of starch back up front because they've got some good back rowers um, and and that's what they really needed. But it makes me wonder, like, with all of these players off contract, like, Sean Johnson is the thing I'm thinking of. He's coming off an Achilles injury, which, like, that's devastating. That's one Mm -hmm. of those injuries that used to finish a career. Doesn't do that anymore, but... For a player like Sean Johnson, an Achilles injury is terrible. Yeah. I, I can't re-sign him, but I think they'll be really tempted to. Yeah, well, I mean, they'd be tempted to because up until that injury, he was having he was starting to really, really play some good footy for the Sharks, mm. setting up a lot of tries out wide. And their defense was – I mean, their attack was absolutely humming. Mm. Um, so – 
yeah, they'd be wanting to hang on to him. I think if they were if they're going to be loyal to a Haas player, then they need to put that loyalty in Sean Johnson, not Chad Townsend. Yeah, Chad Townsend, he fell off a cliff like he's done. It feels like it, yeah. It's it's really, really strange. Obviously, Matt Moylan, I mean, you 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 know, put him in a in a in a taxi as soon as his contract's up. Yeah. Get him out of there. But yeah, think- the the Sean Johnson one is the interesting one to me. I think they'll be rid of Josh Dugan. But um, and, and Townsend, look, I think another club will pick him up. I think another club will give him a go, and I don't know who it'll be. But Johnson's the the weird one for me because, as you say, he showed something last year. But man, I I couldn't re-sign him. I I think it would oh, be no. one of those things of like, I'm sorry, Sean, but I've got to let you go, even though I don't want to let you go. Yeah, that's pretty much what it would be. Um. And I think the only real signing they need to make will be to replace Dugan and yes. maybe get one dominant half. Yeah. Yeah, you would want to have – although, you know what, I mean, and I know Wade Graham's starting to get up there in years, but he's always there as a backup, you know, as a playmaker. I know you want him in the pack, but he's always there to take that pressure off if needed. you know what I mean? Oh, that's true. That's true. So he's the perfect sort of – if you can't have a, an old head in the halves, he's this perfect sort of player to have in your pack. It's a good problem to have, though, the fact that they've got so many places in their side mm-hmm. shored up with youngsters. Yes. And so much money coming, you know, coming available to them within the next year and a half. Yeah. That's a good situation to be in, and that comes down to good roster management. Again, another thing that John Morris is proving to be very good at. Would you give Josh Morris, uh, John Morris, sorry, a three-year deal? Definitely. I would right now. Definitely. Yeah, I can't see any reason why I wouldn't. Yeah. I, I think that even for the – just the club overall, just having that stability is good for them. Yeah. How many clubs can carry Chad Townsend as a chief playmaker and make the finals? Yeah. <laughs> But in the form that he was in last year and still made the finals, have yeah. an absolute rookie at hooker and have him develop as quickly as he did in Blake Braley. Yeah, it's it's mind-boggling. I I can't speak high enough of John Morris as a coach. Yep, and, and you may have said, you know, outside of like it was hard to not give it to Cleary last year for what the Panthers did, but... Man, you could have said Josh Morris, coach of the year, last two years in a row. I, I couldn't have argued too hard about it. No. Um, next, the Knights. Oh, man, the Knights. They made the finals last year for the first time since 2013. Uh, yeah. Was it that far? Man. I think it might have been. Jeez. Yeah, 2013, they made the prelims. 2014, they finished 12th. Spoon, 2015, 16, 17, finished 11th in 2018 and 2019, and then 7th last year. They got Tyson Frizzell, their big signing. Um, There's been a lot of issues with Mitchell Pearce, obviously, off the field, and they seem to have – it's weird. It feels like they've punished him a little bit on the field for it, and he seems to have copped it, which is even weirder. Yeah. you know, their forward pack will be a little bit stronger, which is good. As long as they don't have, like, 57 catastrophic injuries to hookers and 5'8", <laughs> they'll go better than they did last year because that's what happened last year. Uh, um, that's and, so and, true. Yeah, it's crazy. Kalen Pong is, you know, not having it, not not worrying about if he's going to re-sign or not. That's a good thing. He's there now for a few more years, and he should be a better player this year. It's going to be interesting to see. The, the player I want to see really step up for them this year is Bradman Best. I think he's got the ability to play for New South Wales this year if he comes out and plays in the form that he could play in. Yeah. He's a, a massive dude, a massive athlete. He's got a little bit of that injury proneness about him early on in his career, but he's still only young. But I feel as though he could be – I feel like, like if things turn out for him, he could be a test centre. It, like I just have that higher rap on him. Yeah, he's pretty damn good. That's the thing. They've got this really strong 
young back line. And I wouldn't change any of it. It looks so damn good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's their halves. That's the only thing I'm worried about is their halves. I agree. There's, there's no real strike power there. As we mentioned before with Mitchell Pearce, he does a job pretty solidly. But he needs – Yeah, I think he would go pretty well if he had Kalen Ponga at six. Yes. Just a bit of X factor in the halves next to him. And I think Blake Green – for me, is the wrong fit for what they need there. Like Blake Green's the sort of bloke you put into a side next to a 19-year-old half. You know, you need you get that old head around there to take a bit of pressure off when, when you need to, and that's it. I don't see why you put two old heads who do a solid job, you know, equally the same together. To me, that's that's not a recipe for success. And it's weird. The way that Pong plays... I think he's one of the few players that I feel as though would take less damage playing at five eight than he does at fullback, because he's got such good footwork and he, he like when he's running the ball back he comes back at a million miles an hour. Like I feel like he's starting to get beaten up a little bit playing at fullback. And if you look at the fullbacks around the league, a lot of them are big dudes now, yeah. like they're big solid dudes. And and Ponga isn't a big dude. Like he's not, he's more built like a Jonathan Thurston where he's, he's a little bit wiry. He's bigger than most human beings out there, but for a football player, he's, he's more of a wiry person. And I feel as though playing him at five eighth would actually help him a little bit. Um, but I agree with you. Like I, I like a lot of this, this Knights team. They're not outstanding, but they're pretty solid, but the halves that worry me. And, and I agree with you. Like if you get someone in there next to Pierce, like, Look, at Benji Marshall would have been good on this team, I reckon. Um, but they need someone next to Pierce to do the playmaking. And Ponga can do that from fullback, but they need another half because Ponga can't be the one point of attack at the end of games. We That's saw right. how that works at the end of last year. All you do is you just, you know, watch Double Ponga team. and that's it. Yeah. And that's the thing is um, Ponga, when he runs the ball, you see a lot of fullbacks when they're chiming into the back line. Um, Tedesco is a good example where he runs around and across a lot more than he runs direct and straight. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of centers will run on a pretty set line. Ponga runs a much straighter line when he's in the back, when he's in the back line. And I think if you put that at five eighth, he'd be a lot more damaging. Yeah. Um, just, a, you know, one or two steps in, in from the ruck uh, in towards the middle. And you could link with any one of those, Beefy centers or, you know, strong back row. I mean, Lockham Fitzgibbon or Tyson Frizzell running off him in the middle would be insane. Yeah. Um, Mitchell Barnett as well. They're very good line runners, those guys. So it's – they do have a very solid team. Um, so I expect them to make the finals again. Yeah, I feel like they're a fringe finals team. Like, I, mm. think, I think they'll definitely make the finals, but I think it'll be seventh or eighth. Yeah, no, I think that'll be – Read about where they are, and a lot of it will come down to just what their halves managed to do. Yeah, I agree, and and injuries as well. Like, yeah. I mean, if they get smashed by injuries again, who knows? But if they can stay relatively injury free, they're not going to be a fun team to play against. No, and then no. the X factor of Ponga, who I think I rate him higher than you do. I I, I like I think he's a proper out and out superstar. I think if they can keep it close, he can win a game for you. I, know, I, th- I think he's he's def- definitely worthy of the raps he gets. I just yeah. think that um, maybe it's to do with the way the Knights have used him, mm-hmm. but I think the plays that he provides are at times can be seen as being a bit one-dimensional. Yeah. But he will drift. More often than not, he will drift left. Yeah, yeah. And he'll either pass to a straight running forward or he'll, or uh, sorry, center, or he'll take the line on. And I think if you just put one sliding defender on him and one stationary defender on him, you can shut him down. Yeah, but, and it's funny because, like, that's if someone says, What's Ponga doing as you play? Like, he is, he's drifting left. And, but I think you can get away with that if you've got another point of attack in the side. And I think that's where the Knights really struggled last year is that when the game would be close and the game was on the line, Pierce disappeared and it was up to Ponga and he was the one point of attack. And so you would get teams that they'd just load up on Ponga because if you shut him down, the Knights weren't doing anything else really. 
And so I think that's why it's so key to have somebody in the halves that is alongside Pierce that can do a little bit more playmaking than Pierce when the game's on the line so that you don't end up in this one-dimensional, you know, plays with Ponga just trying to pull a game out of his ass while the opposition is loading up on him defensively. Yeah. Um, I think it would like, I think that if they could just get, you know, Dylan Brown, someone like that would be perfect. Yeah. Outside Pierce. Absolutely. And I think that if you, they got a player like that, it, everything opens up for them. I think that would be like 50% better as an attacking side. Yeah. I mean, another thing I'd have on there is just have, you know, if he's going to go left, have the left center running an inside line yeah. and have the winger running back in towards Ponga possibly or just running straight down the sideline depending on what the defense is doing. But just give him an inside option as well as an outside option. So he's got three options. Go left, go right, go yourself. Mm-hmm. You're not going to put three defenders on one man. Two you can cover, but you're not going to put three on one man. And it's just it's just a little simple little addition they could put to their attack which then makes Ponga even more dangerous. And he can run a similar play, you know, on a regular basis with just immense, if you know, attack all the time and just, you know, great effect. It will just keep working. I also think that, like, you forget how young he is. And as a playmaker especially, he's very young for a playmaker. And I feel as though he hasn't got to that point yet where the game has slowed down for him. And I think when he gets to that point, he is going to be absolutely unbelievable. Oh, like absolutely. I think at the moment, the game is still a million miles an hour for him, and he plays a million miles an hour with the ball in his hand. But yeah, when the game slows down for him and he, he starts adding those wrinkles to his game, man, what a player. I can't wait. To, it's exciting to when you get a player like him and you think, I'm going to get to watch this guy for years. I love that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I've got to ask, how do you think um... – the 19-year-old Bailey Hodgson will go. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> like, I, I think... You can just see if he gets to play in his first grade. You know, he's the uh, the young English kid that's come along. Yeah. It's interesting to see if you, if they'll put him in out on the wing or at fullback when, you know, if and when Ponga goes to play Origin, if he's not injured, I guess. Yeah, and, like, that's the thing. Like, you look at this night side and... It's pretty set, you know. It's it's going to be hard to get into this team just on form. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Like, you know, they brought him over for a reason. I think they're going to give him plenty of time to – to like, that's the good thing about some of these young players that from England that NRL clubs are targeting. Like, Farnsworth's a good example where clubs are getting these young players, like signing them up on athletic ability and giving them time. And look, they don't all pan out, but you just need a few of them to pan out, and it, it works pretty well. Yeah. Um, one thing the Knights need to work on for next year, or for this year, sorry, is their consistency. Yes. Because um, their last five or six games last year, they had this wild thing that happened nearly every week where they can see the shit ton of points, next week they'd score a heap. Then they can see the heap, then they'd score it, and they could see the heap, and it just went on and on. You go, you cannot be a threat at any level in this game if you're doing that every week. Mm-hmm. And that that was a huge problem for them at the back end of the season. You know, they lost to the Warriors by 30. They beat the Sharks by 28. They lost to the Roosters by 30. They beat the Dragons by 24. They lost to the Titans by 30. Then they lost to the South by 26 in the finals. I mean, they've got to start closing those those margins they they are way too wide yeah but like you could you could understand it when i mean how many times did you say oh this you know this is the the fourth hooker they've used in the game oh and he's out for the year like there was that remember there was that one game where they had about three different players leave with the fucking season ending injuries like they they were they copped injuries at wasn't that the 14 all times wasn't that the 14 all draw with penrith was it against us was it I think so. Man, I didn't know it was against us. I just remember, like, they just kept losing players and then they'd put someone in that position and then they'd lose him. And it was it was the nightmare. Like, they yeah. did pretty good when you consider. When they get, look, when they got into the finals, 
they were done, they were finished, but yeah. it was understandable. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll move on to who's next? The Rabbitohs. Oh, this is going to be a good one. I'll, I'll be honest, okay. Mm-hmm. After seeing what they'd done in the uh, the off season, uh, I, I wasn't overly excited about South. Yes, but when I saw the way they were working in the trial match, and yes, I know it was only a trial, but how fast their attack was moving and how they were moving in bunches, and how smooth everything looked, I went, you know what? I think they're going to be a top four side. I have them as one of the three real premiership contenders this year. I think they are, they've moved up there with the Panthers and the storm. And then I think there's a bit of a gap. Um, I, I, you know, if, if Latrell Mitchell can stay injury free, that's the big thing for them. Um, I, I love the look of their team. I think they're going to be terribly hard to beat this year. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've just got so much strike across the field. So much strike. Like, when you think they they kind of picked up Josh Mansour late in the piece, and he's a bloody good winger, you know? Mm. Um, I I, I really do. I love their halves. They've been together for a long time. Their forward pack is pretty good. Their their spine has played together for a fair, fair while now. Latrell Mitchell's got the ability to be like a you know, a game breaker of the highest order. Um, if Gagai plays like he's in a maroon jersey, he'll be the best player in the world. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and then you throw in the fact that, you know, round one, they've actually put Benji Marshall on the bench. Yeah. And yeah. there was talk that um, from some media who doesn't understand how rugby league's played, that he was playing as a middle running forward in training. Yeah. And I don't think Benji's going to be coming on the field as a forward. No, I, I agree with whoever the alcoholic is that said that, that he's going to be a Jason Talmalolo, Benji yeah. Marshall. He's going to put on a few more kilos, like, I don't know. About 20. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, he's going to play like Talmalolo. The thing we said when they signed Marshall is that he is great cover for if they get an injury in the halves leading into the finals, which has happened a few times to them. And it's, like there's been a couple of times where they've been – one of the favourites, and they've been crueled by injury in halves. And Marshall covers that now. Um, He's a handy player to bring into a, into a game with about 25 minutes to go as oh, well, too. Oh, it, like unfair. Just unfair. Yeah. You can take one of the centres out and just put Benji over there on one side. Yeah, and just say wreak havoc. Just go out there and, you know, yeah. play a roaming role, and he'll be able to do that. Yeah. Um. I, I, I love this house. St. Jai Arrow, what a signing he is. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. The only problem that they may have a, a weakness in is going to be in the front row. I don't yep. know if they've got a huge amount of depth there, but that's pretty much it. There's very few weaknesses in this spot. Yeah, and I, th- I think with the faster game, like Thomas Burgess is pretty mobile for a big dude. That's yeah. that's one of the things. Um and I think with the faster game, if as long as you've got a lot of good back rowers, you might be able to cover your front rowers not being having that much depth. And Souths do have a lot of great back rowers. Like they've got some some of the best back rowers in the game. So I just think that – and like Cody Walker in a faster game. Oh, got like Damian Cook. There's, there's two players who – if you had to pick two – like a hooker, that was perfect for a faster style, it's Damian Cook. If you have to pick a 5'8", who's better for a fast style, it's Cody Walker. I really, really, I might have them, oh, no, nah, I can't. I can't say someone's ahead of the storm because that's stupid because <laughs> it's just a numbers game. Everyone's behind the storm until they're proven wrong. But that's how highly I rate them. Like I could put them in the, the you know, the semifinals right now. And we've only got really one extra spot to work out between the top four teams. That's how highly I rate this South team. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, they're they're phenomenal, phenomenal on paper, and their form at the end of last season, um, their attack was red hot. They were scary. They were scary. They were scoring points at will. Mm-hmm. Look at it, they they put sixty on the Roosters, and that was a full strength Roosters side. 
Yeah. They then put 46 on the Knights in the finals. Then they put 38 on Parramatta Mm -hmm. in the finals. Parramatta, while their attack hadn't been that flash, their defense was pretty, pretty strong all year. Yeah. So that's 144 points in three games. Yeah, and that's the thing I look at with this team. Like, with a, a settled spine, and it, it, a lot of it comes down to Mitchell staying injury-free. And look, look, it was a freak injury that he got. It's not like he's an injury-prone player. But if if he can stay on the field and that spine stays together, and then they've got Marshall as a backup in the halves, oh, man, that they they might be the best attacking team in the competition this year. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about that in my mind. They're going to be very hard to stop. <laughs> they could uh... be. For as far as where they finish, between minor premiers and third, I think yeah. third is like, I think the top three teams are all so good. Uh, but yeah, and you could pick any of them top three teams for the minor premiership. So yeah. Absolutely. Uh, next, we move on to the Raiders. I and, don't know how I feel about the Raiders this year. Yeah, look, I think, I think when a lot of teams around them are, uh, you know, having small improvements to their roster. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking that the Raiders have moved much. I don't think they've gone backwards. Mm-hmm. I just think everyone else has sort of caught up to them a bit. Yeah. So they're going to hang around that fifth to eighth region on the ladder. I don't think they're, they're a bottom eight side. They're, they're mm-hmm. too solid a squad across the park. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll still be in the finals. Um Unlike you, I think George Williams was reasonable enough last year. Um, Josh Hodgson, though, I think he's under huge threat from Tom Starling. Yeah, I, I read a thing where they were saying that he might be playing a little bit in the forwards at Josh Hodgson uh, in the back row, which I think it'll, it'll get busted immediately if he does that. I personally, if I'm Ricky Stewart, I'm... I'm going with Starling as my starting hooker. And Hodgson is, you know, he's on the bench at best. Uh, I need to move forward from that. I think they were better without Hodgson. Oh, Starling was so, so nippy Mm -hmm. out of dummy half, so quick off the mark. Um, And he made better decisions too. Like, I I know people like Hodgson. I think his decision-making is really poor. And I, I just think that Starling, as soon as he come into the side, the Raiders just look like a better team to me. When Hodgson gets the ball from dummy half, he tends to want to take a step or two forward and look at his options around, which worked perfectly fine in the game it was when he got over here, mm. because it gave him, a, you know, it gave I dare say the Raiders forwards enough time to run either side of him and gave him options either side or go out the back. But with the game speeding up. Um, especially when we started trying to clear the ruck up or just let the shit go on and just have a quick play of the ball. Yeah. That dawdle out of dummy half and look around, it just sees him getting caught napping an awful lot more and throwing a more pushed pass. Whereas Starling darts out of dummy half first or makes a, makes a decision to pass off the ground straight away. He doesn't have that one or two step and look around caper that Hodgson does. Yeah. I think if Hodgson makes a crisper decision when he gets to the dummy half instead of waiting after he picks the ball up. I think he'd have a lot better season. Um, I'll give him one thing. There's very few people as good as him at one-on-one steals. That's true. That's true. Ah, hey, right. But he's, he's coming off a real bad injury. Um, yeah. He's not the youngest bloke in the world. Well, he, and that's because of those injuries. He's had a few now in the last two years. It stopped him from being able to gain that momentum that good form brings. Yeah. Um, so hopefully he's had, you know, a good off season. He comes into the season fully fit and raring to go because I'd, in the current thing, I'd probably start with him yeah. and then have him, have Tom Starling come on for the last 20 minutes of a game. And that way you're not burning out Hodgson, but you're giving Starling plenty of time to, run wild against tiring forwards and stuff. When you look at this Raiders outfit, like they they feel as though a team that, that got pretty close and couldn't quite get the win. And th- they feel as though they need an injection of new blood into the team. 
and I'm not seeing it. Like, I know they added Ryan James, but the chances of Ryan James playing more than five games this year are pretty low when you look at his, you know, injury run that he's on. And I, I just feel as though they, this is a team that is desperate for a, a couple of young players that just go out there and rip in. Um, they're a very settled team. that That's probably going to be a good thing for them and their consistency. But, yeah, I, I would like to see them add a few more good young players to this team. And that's what Starling is, you know. That's why I think that I would start him as well. I think they need something different. I think if they do what they've done in the past, they're going to get the same results. I need, I think they need to try something different. Yeah, I, there's a few things that they need to work on. First one is going to be the combination between Curtis Scott and Jordan Rapana because mm-hmm. um, that's not working too well. No. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I think one that will work well is Jared Croker and Caleb Aikens. I think Aikens will be really good on that wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Croker will work really well with him. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I mean, Ryan James has been listed to play this weekend. I think he's on the bench. Uh, if he stays injury free, which, you know, I think he's undergone quite a few operations to get himself you know, perfectly fit for this season. Yeah. If he does stay fully fit, he is going to be quite a quite a good addition to that side. And I think an improvement on John Bateman, who tailed off pretty savagely at the end of last year, or during pretty much most of last year to what oh, he did in his first season there. So overrated by people, it's unbelievable. Um they've got some good young forwards there. They do have a little bit of depth. So they stay just, injury free. I, I think they're going to be pretty solid still. They, they're they're going to be solid, but I just feel like even when you look at their forward pack, like there's not much variety there, which worries me. You know, like they're hard ball runners, they're hard to tackle and stuff. But I I just think I would like to see a bit more playmaking in their forward pack. You know, I I look at their their centres. Curtis Scott was at times abysmal last year. Um. And Croc is coming off a bad injury and, you know, his defense is still pretty terrible. I don't know. I just feel as though they need to make some tweaks to, as you say, a lot of the teams around them, like the storm of the storm, the Rabbitohs have moved past them. The Roosters are just better than them. The Panthers have improved. The youngsters have improved way past them. Like, I just think that you can't stand still. Because if you do, you're going backwards in the NRL. And I look at this team and I can understand looking at it and Ricky Stewart thinking like, I like what I've got. I know they're going to be pretty good, but I feel as though they need an injection of something extra to catapult them back up into the premiership race proper. Yeah, that's fair enough. (laughs) I can't argue with that. Aren't we supposed to argue? I thought in these day and age, you just argue Uh, with everyone to the death about everything. We had a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're into the final four here. Okay. Let's power through. Let's power through. So the Roosters. Now, if um, I don't know if you saw them here, but the only person that, that's been signed in the NRL this year has been Joseph Suwali. Yes. They haven't uh, made a decision yet if they're going to ma- let him play or not. Well, he hasn't been named this week, so I'd probably leave it at that. Um <laughs> They've lost a few players and only really brought in Adam Kieran and, and Sawali, who we mentioned. Um, Mitchell Orbison retired. Uh, Farmer Sully's gone to the Dragons. Flanagan's off to the Dogs. Ryan Hall's gone back to England. And Tui Palutu's gone to Manly. So no real massive changes to the side. Um, they're still a top-quality team. I think... I think they're probably going to start working on replacing Boyd Cordner this year. Yep. Um, and it looks like they've also decided to move Maria Hargrave to the bench. Yep. So Collins will get his chance to be the starting prop. Um, Radley being back will be huge for them. Yes. They really missed him. Like I think, I think we were talking about it when he went down. It felt like that was the X factor gone for the Roosters. And I That's think right. It, it, proved to be the case for them. Um, you, I'll also you know, get Sam, Sam Verrill's back as well, who's um, a yes. very good hooker. As, I think 
I think they're waiting for him to come back and be fully fit and get some game time before they decide whether they're going to move on Jake Friend or not. Yep, yep. Um, this feels like not a premiership tilt season for them. Like, they're a very good team, but it feels like one of those seasons where they're probably just taking a step back and waiting to retool, almost like what I want to see the Raiders do. Um, yeah, although they've got a much, much stronger squad. The only yeah. the only real question marks here is going to be on Lachlan Lamb. Well, um, I think him and Luke Keery, like if Luke Keery, he, he was getting banged around a bit. Mm. And they can't afford that this year. They just can't. No. But Lachlan Lamb, yeah, he's been one of those players that for a long time has had pretty big raps on him. And it, it's now or never for him. It really is. Yeah. It's um, plus you know he's coming to a side after Kyle Flanagan got got signed on a deal and they just went oh he's not the right fit and pissed him off. Mm-hmm. So third year and third different half. Cronk you know, one year, Flanagan the next, Lamb this time around. Um, I think that adds a little bit of extra pressure to him because he knows that if he doesn't perform well enough, they'll just piss him off and find someone else. Yeah, and I don't that, think that's, that's what the Roosters sort of, do. Yeah, and I don't think that's the sort of pressure when you're putting on a young half. No, um, especially one that's had that, you know, he's been one of those, he's going to be the next halfback sort of players for yeah. the Roosters, which they've had a few of them that they've done that to. Um, I want to see Joseph Manu have another big year. I think he was a little bit quiet last year. Um, you know, having the Morris brothers... They're, they're going to get the job done, but they are starting to get older now. And at some point, the club is going to have to look to replace them. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who they sign for next season for me. Because, as I said, I think that there's a little bit of retooling that needs to be done here. And I feel like they will be a team that will be more likely to change the way they build their team as well, based on the rules. And I think that's why where e. Hargraves has gone back to the bench. I think that they're looking at being more mobile. They've got so many good back rowers. Um, they can do that. So it's going to be a really interesting season for the Roosters. I don't think – I think it would take something special for them to be a real premiership threat. But if they were fourth, I wouldn't be surprised. No, I I still rate them as one of the um, premiership contenders. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if – you know, with, as far as the Morris goes, Morris brothers go. Um, Joseph Sawali will probably play on the wing. Yep. As a as cover for Brett Morris. Yeah. And they just need someone to cover in and cover Josh Morris. Whether that's someone they buy into the club or what they do, I don't know. Um, Adam Kieran's been signed from the Warriors to cover as a half as well, so they've got a little bit of depth there if they need it, which is a handy thing to do given that Kerry can get a bit knocked down from time to time. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty solid squad, top yeah. to bottom. There's not any real strong weaknesses. I mean, Jake Friend isn't much of an attacking player, but when you've got that amount of attacking weapons in the team, you can carry someone like him. And he's yeah. a he's a bloody good defender. So, you know, that's why their def- their you know middle defense is so damn strong. You've got someone like that defending in there as well. Um. Yeah, Boyd Cord is the only one they need to scratch their head on, I guess, and figure out what they're going to do with him. Do they say to him, look, Boyd, we think you should probably just step aside. We'll give you a job as a coach for the rest of your life. Um, you got to start looking after your head. If if I was advising Boyd Cordner, I'd say you got nothing to prove retire. Mm. I wouldn't be shocked if Boyd Cordner come back for a send-off game. You know, I, I feel like that's at the point where we're at with his career, unfortunately. Um, because yeah, it's, it's not good what, what we've seen happen with him. And, you know, I I think that that would also, if they don't have Cordner, that would also be one of the things where they kind of think to themselves, like, where are we at this year? Is this the year that we're going all out or do we need to take some time, try to develop Lamb at half and, and see what happens for next season? Um, I, wonder what's happening with Sonny Bill Williams because we haven't heard anything about him. I, I don't believe things, he's... I saw a thing saying that he was working as a um, mentor for Suwali, I think it was. Yeah, and like, you know, if he'd 
if he was going to play rugby union elsewhere, I think it would have been done by now. He, you know, he's not going to play rugby league for any other club. I, I, you know, is he going to, is it now at the point of his career and where he's at physically where he thinks to himself, look, I can put in half a season and that's it. Or maybe not even half a season, maybe even like I'll be ready for the last two months of the year for your season. And if that's the case, that's cool. But it's it's just interesting that we haven't heard anything about him. For all of the hype and stuff about, you know, Sonny Bill Williams, where's he going, what's he doing, oh, he's a rooster, blah, blah, blah. It's been nothing. It's really well, that's, weird. That's because we've been distracted by there's been no news about Cameron Smith. Well, I think it's disgusting that Cameron Smith is uh, acting like this independent human being. How dare he? Well, Sonny Williams is in the same same boat. Ah, disgraceful. It is. Um, yeah, next, I guess, is the the Eels. Hmm. I, I don't know how I feel about the Eels either, hey? The thing about the Eels for me is I think on paper they genuinely do have a top top four team. Mm-hmm. But the game plan they have makes them a team that finishes a bit lower than that. And I know they finished third last year, but their attack was one of the worst attacks in the competition. Yeah, it was a wet sail third place, wasn't it? Mm. Um, their defense was very, very good. And so that's what they've got to work from. Mm-hmm. They're, I don't know. They've got to do something with Mitch with Mitch Moses because he does have all the skills. But I think as soon as the coach sees him getting the ball and either passing it or kicking it and not running fifty percent of the time at least, mm-hmm. got to put him aside. Say, Mitch, you're being a pussy. <laughs> Take it to the line occasionally, mate. Because when he runs to the line, every defensive team stands back and waits. Yep. As soon as they do that, points just start flowing for the for the Eels. You saw it at the start of last year. They were just scoring points whenever the hell they wanted to because Moses was running the ball. The minute he started doing this drift and sideways caper, the points just dried up because the defense would just hold off on him. They knew he was going to take him on, and they just shut down all his play options he was trying to set up. I mean, that's why we saw Blake Ferguson struggling to score points. Yeah, yeah. And, like, the, I think the thing that you can look – because I, I'm kind of like you. I look at this the Eels team, and I'm like, I like it. I, I like it from top to bottom. And so what do, what do I need to change? And you sort of focus on Mitchell Moses. I think Dylan Brown's going to be better this year. When they lost him last year, it was really bad. And when they got him back, they looked a lot better. But by then, Mitchell Moses was injured and he, they were basically carrying him. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how Brown has developed as a player. I think he's going to be better. I like their forward pack for the new quick rules. Um, yeah, that forward pack is insane for the for the, the new rules. Yeah. Campbell, Campbell Gillard as a, as a prop, uh, that's just a, a brilliant thing because he's, he's got plenty of speed about him for a big man. Mm-hmm. I like the only other thing I don't like about their their lineup is Blake Ferguson. I I think that I wouldn't be shocked if well, a month into the season somebody else is playing on the wing for them. I think their centres this year are a bit poor. I mean, you look at Tom Opechik and Wanga Blake, mm. and you put Blake Ferguson outside them. I think I think those three players is a weakness. Well, see the thing about Blake and Blake used to play for the Panthers. And I remember a game with, that Blake played, and he looked like Greg Inglis. Like he tore – I can't remember yeah. who it was against, but he tore an opposition team apart just with his physical dominance, and he couldn't be stopped. But you wait 20 games for him to have a game like that, and that's the problem. And so, like, if he has that game in, in a final series – the, this Eels team is getting like an unstoppable force. But the problem is you might not see it this year, you know. Um, it, it The backs, like they've got size, which is the thing, and that's the way the Eels play. The other thing is Gutherson. Like They're not getting enough out of Gutherson in his running game from fullback. He can't just pass the ball on. 
You know, he can't just bash up his wingers by making them run everything back themselves. Um, but, you know, if you if you looked at this team, I mean, it's a very similar to last year's team. They should be pretty good. You would feel like they're a fifth, sixth place side at worst. But on a good season, they, you know, if they have a really good year, they could maybe pinch one of the top three side uh, places. But I don't know. I feel like... I feel like teams worked them out a bit last year. And I think that the new rules will help the Eels, but they're going to help a lot of sides. And I just wonder if teams have worked them out. I know. See, if Blake Ferguson's hands were a bit better, mm-hmm. hey, I wonder careful. if he... <laughs> I'm, I'm talking purely footy here. Yes. Um I wonder if it, if they would be a stronger outfit if he was at fullback, mm-hmm. Gutherson was at centre, and put who cares on the wing. Yeah, it, it'd be Cause, worth a shot. Because Ferguson's a much stronger ball runner, and I think mm-hmm. giving him a bit of room to move and in the middle of the field to run from fullback, I think he, the kick returns, and he's a, a bigger body as well, I think the kick returns would be a lot stronger from him. Well, could you imagine if they had, like, Will Hopperati at fullback? Which yeah. isn't a – like, Will Hopperati, I would say, would be on less than Gutherson. And if you put Will Hopperati into this back back line at fullback, they're a horror show. They're all massive and running back hard with the ball. That's what you don't want to see if you're an opposition team. But what Gutherson does, it's – you know, it's one less play you've really got to worry about running the ball back every single time you kick it downfield. Well, that's because, as I've always said, if, if we're completely honest, he's a 5'8", mm. first and foremost. And that's that's why he doesn't do kick returns that much. It's yeah. not part of a game as a 5'8". You know, he does all the playmaking stuff that you want from a 5'8". But he just doesn't have kick returns in his in his brain. It's not something he has to do. So he doesn't, you know, it's not something he does. Yeah. Yeah. This is the sort of team that could probably have someone like Valentine Holmes at fullback. Yes. Because they don't need to worry about him doing playmaking. Just grab the ball and just run Val. Go, go, go nuts. And it, that would be the sort of addition they have to this side. And you move Gutherson into the centres. Yeah. You know, they might be, they might be the sort of team, and they might be able to get him mid season if they wheeled and dealed. But. You could get Dallin Watini Zelezniak into this back line. Um, and he's and he's playing football this year. They they they'd be horrible to play against. But you know, it's weird. I the Eels, they're just they're missing something and it's hard to put your finger on it. We'll see how they go. I think that they're gonna start the season all right, but I wouldn't be shocked if not like I, I think a month and a half into the season, we might see that the eels are a little bit pedestrian, and I think it'll be because teams kind of have worked them out. That's my feeling, anyway. I think that will happen if Moses is starting to go sideways again. Mm-hmm. If, if he's still running straight, they'll still be hard to stop, and they'll still be winning games. Yeah. Um. Now into the grand finals. Which one right. should we do first, the Premiers, or should we do the Minor Premiers first? Do the, do the Minor Premiers first. All right. Go oh, no, no, no. Do the, no? We'll, no, we'll do it by ladder position because okay. we've got to save the best for last. All right, we'll do that. So we're doing the Melbourne Storm, the yeah. Premiers again. Yeah. Um, they're, they're done. They're really going to struggle without Cameron Smith. How do you, do you replace reckon, a player like Cameron Smith? Do you reckon they'll finish in the top eight? Oh, no. Nah. Like, I mean, Smith's gone. Bellamy's going to retire. Good luck, Storm. It was a good experiment. When do we move the team to Perth? Or Adelaide. Yeah. The Adelaide Storm. Oh, it's it's overdue, Andrew. (laughs) Um, How many tests do you reckon Harry Grant will play for Australia? (laughs) All of them. (laughs) Like if like it's twenty twenty one right now. If it's twenty thirty four, and he's he's still the test hooker, uh, we're not really that surprised, are we? 
Harry Grant is fast becoming my next Tim Brasher. <laughs> I love that. I love what that kid does, man. I've not seen a player just dominate the game from the moment he steps on the field and look so fucking comfortable doing it. A blue chipper from the first game. Oh, just fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah, what a lineup they've got here. It, it's they, crazy. It's so crazy. Imagine getting in a situation where you just go, you know what? We don't really need the best player in the world. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he can just go. We, you, know, you know, if he wants to just go, that's fine. We can cover him. Oh, but, you know, like, we can cover him and then cover the guy that's covering him. Yeah, just in case he gets injured. We've just yeah. got a, another test player behind him anyway. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, get it, the fuck out of here. Yeah. At some point, you're just showing off, you know? That's not, this is just massive dick-waving is what this is. It really is. Um, yeah. As that, they had Billy Slater, <laughs> arguably the best fullback since since Clive Churchill. And just replace him with Ryan Pappenhausen, who's probably going to be the next test fullback after Tedesco retires, if Tedesco doesn't get injured and replaced by Pappenhausen beforehand. And, like... And then they had Croc in the halves, just replace him with Cameron Munster. Another test player. Yeah. Like, like, and the thing is too, like Pappenhausen, like is so close to Billy Slater's style of play. And then you've got Monster who like, was so, is so versatile. Like people forget how versatile he is as a player. Well, he, he's very similar in mold to what Gareth Woodup was when he was there. Yeah. Yeah. Except he's bigger and, and yeah. a harder ball runner. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, what a team. Yeah, I like... <laughs> and then you throw in the fact they've got two two Papua New Guineans in the centres who just run like men possessed. Yeah, that like, are Papua New Guineans the hardest people on earth? It's like they're made I out be- of brick. I believe their bones are made of, you know, forged iron steel. Yeah. Coated in... like Wolverine. Coated in titanium. Yeah. Double-plated. And then their muscles around them are just bricks. Yeah, and like the like, it's crazy that when they pull off a hard hit, because pound for pound, like the Papua New Guinea players, they're not for the most part they're not giants, you know. But when no, they've they got hit, that low center of gravity, sort yeah, of and they hit people and they field. stay hit. Yeah. Oh boy, I love nothing more than watching Papua New Guinea play test matches because they just destroy humans. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. Uh, I, 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 best love, watch. I love everything about this Storm team. I love the coach. I, I, their depth is fantastic. They've got versatility. Uh, I, I just love the you, contrast they've got in there too. I mean, you, you've got these two absolute just straight running powerhouses in the centres in Seve and Olam, and then you're on the wing you've got an absolute speed demon in Addo Car. Mm. And you got this versatile guy like Nico Hines, or you can have this tall bloke in Brinko Lee on the wing. Oh, it's just like and you look at their yeah. lineup and like we take for granted, like Addo Car I, I and we you and me haven't done this yet, and I'm so sure we will eventually. I I think you could make a off the top of your head, Addo Car top ten winger of all time in Australian rugby league. And I think you could probably make a really good good case that he's going to at least end up being one of the top five, if not top three wingers of all time in Australian rugby league. Like he's at that level. And, you know, they've just got him on the wing. Yeah. Well, just for this year. Yeah. Um, He'll do. <laughs> and then you look at, yeah, even Jerome Hughes is a pretty handy player to have in the hearts as well. He's a very good um, ball runner. Mm-hmm. He is slowly developing some, uh, you know, some good halfback skills. He's not an organizer yet, but he's no. he's got a, he's starting to develop a pretty good kicking game. Yeah, um, his passing game's come along pretty well. But his look, running he, game is still good, and he was good enough to get the job done last year. And mm. I questioned whether he was, and he was. He proved it. Yep. Um, you know, and, and he'll be better for that. He's sticking around at the Storm. He didn't take the big offer at the the Warriors, which I thought was a good thing for his football. Yep. Um, and that means that they've got Munster, unless Munster gets a massive offer from this new Brisbane team, 
but it means that Munster and Hughes and Pappenhausen and Grant are going to be around at the Storm for a long while. It's just a shame that it's all over, Andrew, and they're never going to be competitive again. I can't see them go, going anywhere without Cameron Smith. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's throwing the front row. Jesse Bromwich, Tui, Kami Kamitha, um, Kafusi and Bro- Kenny Bromwich on the back row, Finnick and lock. Then you've got to find a spot for Brandon Smith, Nelson Asper Solomona, Christian Welch. It's not like they've got slouches in the forwards either. I mean, this is just a team that's just strong from top to bottom. Yeah, and the other thing is, too, you know that there's going to be three or four players that they've got that we don't even know the names of who are about, you know, 17, 18, 19-year-old who will be test players in five years from now. So, you know, that's just the way the Storm do it. They're one of the best development clubs we've ever had in rugby league. And, um, man, they're so good. It's just... Like, I can't believe people don't like watching the Storm. I love watching the Storm. It's like a, it's like going to school for a rugby league fan, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah, the crazy thing is they've also picked up George Jennings. Yeah. Watch them turn him into an absolute fucking superstar. <laughs> and he, Remus, he, Remus Smith from the Bulldogs, who, you know, they'll probably do the same thing to him. Yeah. Somebody is going to overpay George Jennings in about two years' time. West Tigers. <laughs> They had him. They didn't go to Parramatta. He'll go to Melbourne. He'll score 50 tries in 53 games, and the Tigers will sign him for $600,000. Great. There you go. There's a, there's a hot take. Oh, there's a take. Um, what's their weakness? There is none. Yeah. Uh, Actually, weakness. their weakness is who the fuck do you replace Craig Bellamy with? Like, they've replaced everybody else somehow miraculously. Who's the miracle coach that they find out of nowhere to replace Bellamy to keep this magnificent dynasty continuing? If this just say the storm named an un like an unknown lower grade coach as the replacement, would you be shocked if he ended up coaching there for seven to ten years? No. Yeah, I I feel I mean, that's the way I feel it's going to end up. Who hey? the hell knew of Craig Bellamy being the sort of coach he's become prior to taking over the top job at the store? He was an assistant coach. Yeah. Like Adam O'Brien and everyone else he's been had as an assistant coach that have gone on to do head coaching jobs. It's I, just... I, that's going to be the big thing, is how to replace him and to replace his influence at the club. But, man, if I had to trust any team to be able to do that it'll be the storm absolutely like they've had three coaches in their entire history and one of them was around for like a year and a half yeah you know they they it's crazy it is it's just so, a shame it's over andrew it's just a shame. well it's over yeah i, I do I, I i kind of find myself penciling them in to, as one of the grand finals this year yeah, so do I. So do I. I think they're the team not. to beat. Yeah. Speaking of team to beat, Penrith Panthers. Minor premiers last year, lost just one game, made it to the grand final, played the worst first half of their entire season yep. and still managed to have a bit of a fight back and make a game of it in the end. Yes, and as Phil Gould said, basically the refs cost them the game. And yeah, well, <laughs> how he do you would disagree with him, really. <laughs> He would say that. He's been a referee before, so he would know how to criticise them and, you know, what they've done wrong. Exactly. Uh, Panthers, they lost a little bit of experience. Do they, like, do they even have a 30-year-old in the team now? I, we talked about I Didn't they? I don't think they did because they left far ago, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. He was the one. And and then, yeah, so they, they've lost that experience. I like the the addition of uh, Matt Eisenhuth. I think he's just a, a good, you know, depth player to get. He's a very um, good d- defensive player too. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised in the the way the game's changing that Eisenhuth becomes a starting lock, mm-hmm. and they're more um, prominent attacking forwards are sitting on the bench. So Eisenhuth will do a lot of the dirty work mm-hmm. at the start of the game defensively. Yeah, and then they'll bring him off after you know half an hour or forty minutes or so, and then bring on the attacking players. 
I I watched them in their preseason game against Parramatta. Parramatta weren't bad, but the Panthers looked like they really did look like a team that were they just looked crisp. And, and I know it was only a trial game, but they looked very crisp. Um, they looked up for the challenge. They, you could see the depth was still there in the forwards. Um, they just look primed for me. And, and I, I've said that I think there's three teams that are really the main contenders, Penrith or the other one. Um, you know, it, I think it's just a matter of, I, I think Jerome Luai is the key to their entire season because Cleary, Cleary actually looks bigger and stronger this year. It's really crazy to see. But I think that they need that extra attacking element, kind of like Newcastle. You know, you you know that you can, in some cases, shut down Cleary and you'll at least shut down the playmaking for Penrith. You still got to deal with like Coruscant out of dummy half and kick out, who's just a, a superhero. But if Luai can make it, if he can develop as a player and become a true playmaker and a true attacking option on the other side of the field, it makes this Penrith team an absolute nightmare to play against. The only real weakness I feel like they've got is Dylan Edwards at the back. I, I still feel as though, and it's a little bit like the Parramatta thing, Edwards just doesn't offer enough in attack. And if you could get somebody there at fullback, and I wonder if maybe, like Crichton's a fantastic centre, you kind of don't want to move him. But if you could get someone at fullback that just could give you more in attack, no one wants to play that Panthers team. So that's really the only weakness I see with them. Um, as a Panthers fan, I've got to say, I, I love what I'm seeing. I love the lineup. There's a lot of depth. They're basically back almost man for man. And I think they're, once again, going to be really hard to beat. Yeah, they're a pretty strong side. Um, it looks like Paul Momorowski will now uh, move into the centres where Faro was, which is not a bad thing. He's He's a pretty handy player. Yep. Um, and if Cleary's missing through injury or, you know, rep duties, uh, he's a very, very good goal kicker. He can fill in that role there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they've got, they're going to have a very mobile front row. They're not going to be huge, chunky guys. No. But I think that's something that's going to work in their favor, especially when you've got Coruscant, who's pretty nippy at a dummy half. Um, He's going to help them get that momentum on and be on the front foot pretty well. Um, you've got strong ball runners like Martin and Kickow on the uh, on the edges. Even Scott Sorensen, who they picked up from the Sharks, very strong line runner. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of angled runs type plays coming from the Panthers this year, mm-hmm. especially through the middle of the field. Um, I mean, they were doing plenty of them last year. I wouldn't be surprised if they stick with that because it. They are hard to shut down, and they don't have to. They don't have to be too, um, you know, tricky. I guess to make them work, they're pretty simple plays to work. You just need players running the right lines. Yeah, um, and they they do the basic things right, which is what makes them so hard to beat. Yeah, and like they've got little parts to their game, which are, you know, like when um, to O runs the ball back. He's such a hard ball runner. Mm. And just little things like that. I mean, Staines is one of the quickest plays in the competition. Crichton is a, I mean, he's a ridiculous athlete. He could go the length of the field. Uh, Cleary, as I said, he's he's bulked up. He looks actually really good, uh, which was interesting to see. He, he looked really solid. Fish Harris was great last year. He's going to have another good season. And I think these, these rules are really going to help someone like him because um, he's, a, he's a very mobile player, but he, he loses nothing in the in the um, impact side of the game. And then, you know, if – and I don't think they really worked it out last year, but if they can work out the best way to use Kikau, man, he's – he could be the best attacking option in the whole competition. Like, he's got that ability to be – just like a hand grenade going off in the middle of the match where all of a sudden this close game just got blown open because kick out through a couple of players aside like the Hulk, you know? So as a Panthers fan, we're used to having one-off good seasons, 
So it's kind of weird to look at a team that just lost the grand final as a young side and look at them this year and be like, man, when you keep in, you think of the rule changes and stuff, they might be better. Yeah, and when you think that they they haven't really lost, you know, much stock. You know, mm. Akins was, you know, essentially a death player. He went to the Raiders. Mm-hmm. Jack Hetherington was a bench player. He went to the Bulldogs. Mansour, um, pretty much surplus to their needs, given they got stains and took O there as well. Yes. Um, so they can handle him going to South. Tamo, they probably, I suppose they probably would have liked to have keep him on, given they are a little light on him front rollers. Mm-hmm. Um, Tedavano, same sort of thing there, but he's gone to Leeds. And Malachi with Tennis I don't even know if he managed to get on the field for the Panthers, but he's retired. I think he had a health problem. Yes, I can't remember what it was, but it was uh, – uh, I just can't remember what it was, but it was kind of shocking yeah. when I found out about it. So hopefully um, um, he overcomes that. What do you feel like is the weakness in this Panthers side? Um – well, I, I think it's easy to say inexperience. Mm-hmm. But for me, I think the one weakness might be I see Yeo's, um, he, he has he's another one of those players that's had a few head knocks. Yeah. That's the only thing that worries me because he does, he does play that game hard. Mm-hmm. And kind of like Boyd Corner in the same sense, you know, they – they do not shy away from getting into the middle and doing the hard yakka. Yeah. That's why they've got so many head knocks in their careers. Um, so that worries me. But, that, but that's just a worry. It's not really a weakness. Um, I suppose the other one is, as you said, Luai doesn't seem to have much playmaking duties at the moment, and mm-hmm. probably because they're still working on giving him those extra skills. Mm-hmm. He comes across as a bit like a Jerome Hughes type player. Yeah, yeah. He can create a few things, but um, if Nathan Clear is to go down and get injured, I don't think Luai could take over the the playmaking duties that Cleary has and keep steering the team around to the same effect. Yeah, and like we said last year, like you could replace every single player in the Panthers' side and they would probably not miss a beat except for Cleary. He was really the only one that they didn't have a like-for-like replacement for, or even somebody that would come in and do 80 to 85% of what he can do. Yeah, and that is going to be their their problem, is covering him when he's not there, because even if he doesn't get injured, he's you can almost certainly say he's going to be playing Origin. Yeah. So they're going to miss him for you know one or two games. Uh, that That's the problem. Um, the other one is what to do with Tyrone May. He's a bit of a Tyrone Peachy type player. Yeah, and look, I think the the clubs. You know, I think Ivan Cleary's keen to have him in the seventeen. Mm-hmm. But what role he plays and what he where he goes and what he does. Like last year at times he was filling in at centre. Other times he was doing a bit of playmaking duties at five eight. He's just like, uh, I'd, I'd rather someone like him gets given one job for the mm. entire year and he sticks with it because I think that's what would make him better. Yes, yeah, so, and like I think he's one of those players that coaches love because they it, it's almost like what I was talking about before where you know you can chuck him into almost any position on the field and he's going to give you 80% of what you had. Uh, or, he, you know, he's not going to – be this gigantic liability. Like if you played him in halves, you're not going to, it's not going to be like, oh my goodness, we, we don't have a half out there. If you play him at hooker, it, it, he'll get a job done. You know, you could play him in just about any position on the field and he'd get a job done. And coaches love players like that. And Ivan Cleary loves players like that. And, you know, that's why I think he, he likes to have him on the bench. We saw him in the final series playing in the centers and, he got the job done to a certain extent. So, um, you know, it, I, I, I I agree with you. Like if I prefer to have players that have a real specific role, uh, but then you get a player like May, like he doesn't make the team if he's in a specific role. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Like he he wouldn't he wouldn't be in the the centers for me. But then when you bring him off the bench because one of your centers is injured, you like you're thankful to have him. Yeah, he's. But that's the thing. I mean, I I don't know if I'd carry him on the bench when I've got K- Kurt Capewell in the side. Yeah, because Capewell can play center as we saw in Origin. Yeah, and he can play in the back row. So to me, you don't need Tyron May if you've got Kurt Capewell in the seventeen. Yeah, that's a good point. And and I think Capewell can you play? I, he couldn't play in the halves though. No, I wouldn't think so. I mean, it's a, like if you went to the other 15 coaches and said, how bad is this problem to have? They'd say, I would love to have this problem. Exactly. exactly. You know, so. Yeah, it's it's hard to find a an actual weakness with this side. I kind but, of agree with you, though. It's It's kind of like if Nathan Cleary gets injured and, you know, touch wood, he's been bulletproof for his whole career so far. And the other one's Isaiah Yao, if he, if he gets another head knock, like, you know, and Dylan Edwards, I, I, I'm not a fan of Dylan Edwards in terms of, I think the Panthers can do better at fullback, but, you know, I'm pretty happy with what they've got. Well, I mean, what other option have they got at fullback at the moment instead of Dylan Edwards, though? I wonder he's, how Matt Burton would go. I was going to say, he's going to be there beyond next year. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I feel like I feel like if you said to Crichton, almost like Latron Mitchell, if you said, look, we'll give you a season to work out fullback, by the end of that season, he would be one of the best fullbacks in the game. But he's so devastating as a centre. And I, I don't think he's finished, like, filling out. So I kind of don't want to mess with him at the moment. It's working for him right now. I'd just leave him there. But would, um, I was going to say, would Brian to... oh, be a good option at fullback? I feel like I feel like it, the problem is his height. Like because he's he's a stocky player and he's a real powerful ball runner. But I feel like at fullback he would be. Uh, overwhelmed by other tall players from the opposition. You know what I mean? Maybe. I reckon he's got plenty of confidence. I reckon he'd do a pretty good job there. I wouldn't want to tackle him running the ball back. That's Ooh, sure. shit, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> he's an absolute tank. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll always look at wingers to replace fullbacks if, if you need to because, you know, the two things you want are ability to catch and ability to run the ball back, which wingers mm. do as well as any fullback. Yeah. Because um, you, when you've got playmakers and strike players around the field, you don't really need them to be attacking powerhouses. This is just another team that could have Valentine Holmes at fullback. You want to yeah. catch and do kick returns. He does those perfectly well. Yep, 100%. You know, and I, I just feel with Dylan Edwards, it's – He's lacking something that I feel like you need from the top of the line, you know, teams in the competition. You know, if you look at the other two teams, you've got Pappenhausen and you've got, uh, well, I mean, even the Roosters have James Tedesco, but you've got Pappenhausen and Latrell Mitchell at the back. You know, Edwards isn't up there with them. And I think you need someone that's up there with them. As in, like, so can do the fullback duties, but has a bit of ball playing skill as well. Yeah, and it's like when they chime into the back line, you're worried they're going to put the foot down and leave everyone for dead. You know, and Edwards doesn't do that. Would Moses and Bai do that? <sighs> he might bore people to death. <laughs> <laughs> How about Clinton Gutherson? Um, <laughs> I don't know. All I know is he'd be standing in the back line, running his fingers through his hair. Well, I mean, that's half the job, really, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Once again, 80 to 85% of the job done right there. Bingo. <laughs> well, I think that wraps up a pretty exhaustive uh, season re- preview. What do you reckon? I agree. Who would you say at this stage is going to be in the grand final and who would win it? I'm still thinking Melbourne will be in there, and 
Oh, I've got it between Penrith and South. I agree with you 100%. I... It's one of those three teams will be the premier. I feel as though I'm leaning towards Penrith and Melbourne again, just for the fact that Penrith had that consistency last year. They carried it through for the finals, right up to the grand final. They were beaten by a great Melbourne team. And I think they'll have got something out of that and that whole experience last year. And because they're so young and they were learning good lessons last year, I feel like they're going to be a better team this year overall. There you go. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a Penrith South grand final. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked by that either. I'd be shocked if it wasn't one of those those combinations. Yeah, there you go. Hot takes galore. Oh, we know you love a good, hot, frothy take. Yeah, get into your hot takes. Yeah. All righty, well, thanks, everyone, for um, enduring this rather long episode and season preview. We know you love them. Um, make sure you check us out on face, face, uh, Facebook, on LinkedIn, on, I've done it all backwards this time around. Instagram and Twitter at Virgo Freak Pod. Um, also, a huge thanks to our sponsor. Manscaped. Manscaped.com. Go and get yourself the perfect package. Do it for you because you deserve something nice in your life. And why shouldn't that nice thing be shaved genitals? Because that's what Manscaped does for you. So go to Manscaped.com. Put in our exclusive code, which is NRL. You get 20% off. You get free shipping. They throw in a 30-day money-back guarantee, which you never, ever need, because you will be so happy with what they give you in the perfect package with the Lawnmower 3.0, the Ball Preserver, the Crop Preserver. They've got everything you want there. So just go check it out, right? Have a look at their website. And if you want to buy something, NR rules your code, 20% off free shipping. We love manscaped.com. And we love you. That's why we've got this deal for you. Exactly. We love our listeners. Yeah. Only the ones who love us, that's, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that pretty much sums it up. Thanks yeah. for tuning in, everyone. Yeah. Good luck for everyone for the start of the year. We're pumped about it. Absolutely, we are. And there'll be an Ask Kenty coming up soon, too. Hell yeah. <laughs> Get ready for that. (laughs) Um, Thanks for tuning in. Catch us all next time.